Hello, my dear viewers. This amazing story will be very instructive for you. It is very interesting and beautiful. I wish you enjoy watching it. Carlos was born into an ordinary family. His mother and father were simple laborers. His mother worked as a school teacher and his father as a turner at the factory. The boy had always looked up to him and didn't want him to have that. Why do you judge me? His father would ask him sometimes. Who told you I was judging you? The boy would look at him. I see the way you look when I come home from work, the man said. Yeah, I don't want to work for my uncle, especially still such hard labor that pays low. David declared when he was only in fifth grade. Well, I'll watch you go out and get a better job, grinned his father. I won't get a job at all. I'll work for myself, the boy told him. Let's see. Let's see how you do it. Don't say got before you jump. The father was sure that all children have ambitions, and when they grow up, they become more down to earth. What makes you think I can't do it? The boy argued with the man. I too, when I was little, dreamed of many things, that I would travel, that I would have many friends, money, and everything else. But as you can see, none of that came true, he said. You'll see, I'll succeed, the boy insisted. Okay, I'm not telling you anything. It will work out, it will work out. Great, and if not, I'll be right. He smiled at his child. The boy continued to study at school. He had a lot of friends. Already from childhood, he was enterprising. He always had several pens, erasers, pencils in his pencil case. And if before a test for dictation, someone did not have something, he could sell or trade for something. He was loved for that. But at the same time, he was considered a hustler. Why do you take offense at me? If I didn't have a pen, what would you use to write with? It's all clear that nothing, guys and girls realize that he makes good not only for himself, but also for them. Why do you resent me then? Carlos didn't understand it. No, it's just a shame that someone didn't think of it sooner than you did. At recess, they were running around, pulling girls' pigtails. Everything was just like normal kids. Where did you get new mittens again? Mom said to her son. I bought them at the market, he answered her. And where did you get the money? The woman marveled. He earned it. He did not hide from anyone that he sells pens and pencils at school. Well, Carlos, look, someone will kick your ears for it someday. His mother threatened him with her finger. I won't, he told her the boy was already in high school. He planned to join the army and then start his own business. Oh, Carlos, you've got a lot on your mind, sitting at the table with your father. Why imagine, it's all real here, look, he put a notebook in front of him. I have a business plan already written here. And what is it? Father looked at some figures. Oh, you don't understand anything, look. And he began to explain to him what and how he was going to do. No, these numbers are a force for me. My father pushed the notebook away from him. Well, you do not understand. And then why do you ask me to show you something? The father looked at his son and saw that he is still a few years old, but he already understand a lot of things in business. Well, do you have a girl? The man asked him. Why are you interested? The guy smiled. I just want to know how young people behave now, he told him. Yes, there is one in mine, but I do not yet make any steps in her direction, admitted the young man. And why? Wondered his father. And because in a few years I will have to go to the army, and she will wait for me or not, it is unknown, and I do not want to start building relationships just like that, reasoned the boy. But why just so? You will at least understand how to behave with a girl, what to do, where to drive, advised his father. I'll leave it all, Carlos told them they were going fishing. Are you sure you won't freeze? Mom was worried about them. No, we're warmly dressed, they said back. Carlos liked to go to the lake with his father. There they would drill a hole, put a line with a hook in it, and then pull out different fish. We had a catch today. My father lifted the container with fish. Yes, for a long time we have not hunted like this. My son also touched the heaviness of the bucket. We returned home happy and tired. School was coming to an end. We had to salute the motherland. Well, are you ready? Asked his father. For what? Looked at him son. To service in the army, he recalled his those years. For the umpteenth time the man took out an army album and together with his son they flipped through it. Wasn't it hard for you there? For some reason, Carlos started to worry now. No, I remember even with nostalgia, rolled his father's eyes. 
Carlos learned to play the guitar and bought it to take with him. Did you meet a girl? His father asked him. I'm still talking to that one, the boy told him. And what if she does? Will you be together? The father asked his son. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. He did not want to rush things. At the send-off, they walked very cheerfully. Juliet did not leave Carlos's step. Why are you sticking to me? He told her. Carlos, I'll wait for you, I promise, she swore to him. He didn't want to give her any hope. What's to see? She said, I'll wait for you. So I'll wait for you. She even stomped her foot. The next day at the station, he got on the train and went. Juliet waved at him for a long time. Well, daughter, will you wait for me? The boy's father came up to her. Of course, I promised. She looked up at him and shrugged her shoulders. Let's go. He put his arm around her shoulders. They got home. Juliet helped clear the table, swept the floors. Oh, thank you, girl. Carlos's mother told her. Oh, you're welcome. She smiled. After that, Juliet went home and sat down at the table to write her first letter to Carlos. Carlos wrote often, but mostly about the weather, about everyday things, what they were doing, what they were doing. Juliet wrote more about love. She wanted to put all her feelings on the page, but it did not work, so she just waited. Carlos' service did not seem like honey. Every day some tasks, orders, letters home and from home, these were his favorite moments. When it was time to return, he realized that Juliet was really the girl he wanted to be with and spend many years of his life with. She met him at the train station, he saw her from the window, and when he got off the train, he immediately went over and hugged her. After that they went home, where the table was already waiting. They invited their friends and had a very good dinner. Carlos told them all about their service, what had happened, what had not happened. It's nice to sit here at home, at my parents' table, he said. What are you planning to do now? Or are you going to study somewhere? His father asked him. Most likely, I will go, but not full-time, but by correspondence, the son told them. And what will you do yourself? Was the interest of those present at the table. And myself, I will take out my old notebook, where I showed you my business plan, and begin to work quietly, Carlos frankly with his father. I see, what about Juliet? Carlos was curious. And what Juliet she is studying, preparing to become a specialist in administration, he told him. Well, wow, dad even whistled. Carlos needed his first capital to start a business, so he went and got a job at the factory where his father worked. Hey, guys, he walked into the locker room. Hey, if you're not kidding, they shook hands. How's it going in here? Carlos asked them. It's like everywhere else, normal, some days good. Some days bad, some days easy, some days hard, they told him. Carlos looked at his box, nodded his head, and went to see what was going on in the shop. It's not bad here, he looked around. We're not complaining, they said. After a week of work, the men gathered in the locker room. So, who's in favor of sitting down tonight? One of them asked. I don't think anyone would mind, Carlos said. Yes, indeed, you're getting a drink tonight. They laughed at him. Carlos shopped. He was one of the first to arrive, started to wash the meat, and turned on the music. What's that playing? The others were surprised. Yes, there was a song of the year on TV. I recorded it on a tape recorder because I couldn't listen to it, he shared with his comrades. Wow, can you record it for me? Colleagues began to ask. Of course I can't, but it will not be free, he told them, and from the next day began his trips to wholesale bases in larger cities. There he bought both blank cassettes and cassettes with recordings, so that he could rewrite something from them. Carlos, can you record today? They came up to him before the weekend night. Sure, but I don't have a lot of tapes, he counted in his mind. He didn't even think it could work out this way. By now Juliet had graduated and was working in administration. They continued to date Carlos. Everything was going well for them. So, when's the wedding? His father asked him. As soon as possible, Carlos told him. They did talk about it with the girl, but both of them needed to get back on their feet. In the summer, Julia went to get a new position in the administration, and Carlos stayed at the factory for the time being. But on weekends, he would take a large bag, put some cassettes and a tape recorder in it, and go out to the square. He would stand next to the grandmother selling seeds. How's the trade going? His father would ask him at home after he came home from work. It's booming, he pointed to his empty bag. 
I congratulate you, his father couldn't believe that someone really wanted those tapes. But the son went on. He distributed them all at the factory, sold them in the square on weekends, and by the end of the year, he told everyone that he was leaving the factory because he had bought a stall. And what, you're going to work there yourself? His wife didn't believe him. Why not? He didn't understand her. She laughed, but Carlos didn't see anything funny. It was serious, too serious for him. Now that he had more free time, he went to the wholesale market every week. Juliet helped him with the covers. She photocopied them at work. The young man stayed up day and night, writing the tapes aloud, making sure none of them chewed up or did anything else. The business went. There was a lot of work, but Carlos did not grumble. He coped with everything. He realized that further will only be better. At work, he went to work every day, everything he did well. There were a lot of customers, and the city was a monopolist. What are you doing today? His wife came home from work in the evening. Carlos was sitting at the table with a bottle of brandy and some snacks. I'm celebrating my success, he said. Isn't it early? She grinned. I don't think so. Sit with me. Carlos invited her. He'd been self-employed for a year. He was doing well. The money wasn't much yet, but it was starting to come in. Maybe we could buy an apartment or trade for ours, his wife suggested. Look for options, he told her. By this time, Julia was already working as a chief specialist in the youth department. She liked this job, mainly because she only worked with young families, which she herself was a part of. She had a colleague, a young girl who lived with her grandmother. Anna, do you know if anyone is selling an apartment around here? Julietta once asked her. What do you want to buy? She asked. Yes, we are thinking of expanding, maybe. Change mine with an extra payment, the woman shared with her. Listen, let me talk to my grandmother. Maybe we'll change our three-room apartment because we have a lot of it. The girl had complained before that the utility bills are too high. Listen, and I will not even mind. The apartment is very close to the administration to work hand in hand. And in the center, said Sarah. In the evening, she came home and told her husband about it. He also approved of this option. And the next day, they went to see how everything was inside. Since her grandmother lived in the apartment, everything was perfect. The neighbors are normal. They quickly agreed on an extra payment. And in a month, Carlos and Juliet were already moving their things. Oh, I probably won't carry these bags up to the third floor, Juliet said. Why not? Carlos wondered. I think I'm expecting a baby, she said. And you were silent. He put his arm around her and spun her around just outside the entryway. It's not for sure, she laughed. He couldn't believe he was about to become a father. Things were going even better than before. Now there was a big apartment. They had to buy furniture for it, and for that they had to work hard. Carlos continued to make cassettes. Now he had a salesman working at his stall. He bought a car and hired a driver to go with him to pick up the goods. So far, everything was working out as he had planned. Juliet was indeed pregnant. She was now walking around with a huge belly and was getting ready to go on maternity leave. Did you think who would be? Her husband looked at her. No, I specifically told the doctors not to tell me anything. She was cryptic. Two weeks before the birth, she was admitted to the hospital. Juliet didn't resist because she didn't want to be twitchy when it started. It started at 9 o'clock in the evening. There was a sharp prickling in her stomach, then a tutting. Juliet had read about it. So she already knew that her baby would soon be born. It was very painful, but she tolerated it. And then the baby cried in the room. Congratulations, you have a boy, they told her and placed a lump on her chest. Alfred Dushka, said the new mom. She was humbled that she watched and touched her son. Carlos came in the next day, first thing in the morning. Juliet showed him her son through the window, but he couldn't wait for the discharge. He arrived with balloons, flowers, gifts for the doctors. Hello, my darlings, he greeted them on the porch. Hello, she hugged her husband. Together they got into the car and drove home. Grandparents were already waiting for them there. Grandson, hello. Everyone was very happy about the birth of a new member of the family, and the grandparents on her husband's side did it most of all. That's it, now do you have a real family, said the father to his son. Yes, now I'm a father too, Carlos told him. He did not stop. He kept working and soon the stall was a thing of the past. He was building pavilions, in one he was going to continue working, and in the other he was going to open a new store. The further the work went on, 
The more the income became, the boy was growing up, pleased his parents. Everything was good in the family's life, but it couldn't last long because Juliet began to work late more and more often. Where have you been again? Carlos met her late at night at her apartment. You have no idea how much work I have, she undressed. What do I care about your work? I buy everything we live on, he said, the clothes, the apartment, the car, I bought it all. Yes, you bought it all, but so that no one interferes with you, I agreed. I still have some weight in society, she put the kettle on the stove. What, what weight do you have in society? He didn't understand. Juliet was by now the assistant to the head of the city. She dealt with many issues with the construction site, as well as the rewriting of the land on which the pavilion stood in her husband's name. Every day she started coming later and later. Carlos was nervous. He couldn't understand why his wife wasn't home so often. Quit your job. My one paycheck is enough, he told her. No, I am moving up the career ladder. I have a little more to go and I will become a deputy, she told him. What is this official work of yours? It pays pennies and demands a lot. He did not understand her. Carlos practically never left home. He was always there. One day, some friends came to see him. Carlos, how many years, how many winters closed here in four walls and do not go anywhere, they told him. The men set the table and sat around it. Come on, let's get together more often. One of them raised the first glass. Juliet came home when they were still sitting at the table. What's this gathering? She didn't understand. Oh, you go out every day, you're allowed, but I can't go out with my friends, Carlos told her. Why not, you can, but sit quietly, so as not to disturb the neighbors, she shrugged her shoulders and went to her son's room. The friends sat for a while and began to disperse. Come to me again, the owner of the apartment told them. No sooner had the door slammed behind the friends than Juliet jumped on her husband. And what does it all mean? Look what a mess you left behind. Who will clean it all up? She said to him. Why did you start? I'll clean it up. He went to the kitchen and sat down at the table. I'm the one that's acting up. She came in there. That evening they had a whole scandal. It had never happened before. Carlos was bored at home alone. He did not know where to go. So he gave a vacation to the salesman and went to work. Now he wasn't home either, not during the day, not at night. So, where are you disappearing now? His wife told him. Where it is necessary, there and disappeared. I earn money, I get it. He snapped at her. How are you talking to me? She didn't understand. What am I talking to you? We have money, but we cannot spend it anywhere. We cannot even have a normal vacation anywhere, he said. I have to sit at home all day. And who is to blame? Now you are at work. So go on. She did not speak for a long time. Alfred went to the third grade. His parents continued to live and fight. It was impossible to catch either of them at home. Carlos, hi. A friend called him. Hello. He answered him. There is such a topic. Do you want to take part in an interesting game? He asked him. What kind of game? He asked him. Successful people dress up as homeless people and have to live without money for a few days. He explained to him. Why, it's interesting. The man was interested. If you are interested, then come to my firm tomorrow. I will explain everything to you in detail, said his friend, and hung up the phone. Krabos did not tell anyone anything. He wanted to wait until tomorrow and then see how it would be. Juliet, I have to go away for a few days. Don't lose me, he told his wife. Where else do you have to go? Your work is not connected with business trips. She was surprised. I'll explain everything to you later, he told her. It was exciting. He went to bed. The next day, he waited till evening and went to his friend's place where he had invited him. Hey, he walked into his office. Oh, Carlos, hi. So, you're in. His friend looked at him with curiosity. I said, I agree. I'm tired of sitting alone at home, he sighed. Then listen, now you leave here all your clothes, money, phone, and everything else. I'll give you some simple clothes, you could say a robe and I'll send you to the four corners of the world. You'll be in town with no money, no phone, no everything. You'll have to find a man to help you. And then, if you want, you can thank him. He explained the rules to him. So what if I can't do it? He backed up. If you fail, call me from somewhere or come and we'll put everything back the way it was, his friend told him. There was no problem with that. Carlos liked the idea so much he changed his clothes, emptied out everything he had in his pockets, 
His friend drove him to another neighborhood and left him there. He was confused at first, but after half an hour he pulled himself together and went to one of the caves there. Man, come out, said the guard at the entrance. It's so cold outside. Can I warm myself? Are you not a human being? Carlos realized he had a homeless look. I told you to get out of this cafe and go to some diner. The guard shook her head. Okay, excuse me. Carlos walked out and headed where the guard showed him. Excuse me, hello. Can I ask you for some tea? But I don't have any money, he said to the diner clerk. Yes, of course, he replied and made him tea in a plastic cup. Thank you very much. Carlos took it and went to the table. Here, have some more. He handed him some pastries. Thank you. I'll never forget you. She looked at him with eyes as if he hadn't eaten in three days. Which was half true, because there wasn't a crumb in his mouth this morning. Hey, buddy, you got a problem? A man with the same look as him. You're in trouble yourself, he laughed back. Come with me, the man called out to him. I'll finish my food and we'll go. Carlos burned himself, but he drank his tea. After that, he and his new acquaintance left the diner and headed deep into the neighborhood. Where are we going? Carlos asked the man. We'll get warm, he promised. They came to an abandoned heating main, and the new acquaintance rummaged around behind the pipes and pulled out a small bottle. What is it? Carlos didn't understand. Subref, Roger told him in a low voice. They unsealed the bottle and took a sip straight from the throat. Carlos shuddered. Is it strong? But it'll warm you right up, his new acquaintance told him. They sat like that until nightfall. And now they had to find a place to sleep. So Roger took him to one of the houses. There they went down into the cellar and slept on the pipes. In the morning they had to find something to eat, and that's what they did. How'd you get like that? Carlos was wondering how people like that get down. I had a normal job, a family, a kid, a wife, everything, and then one day I blew it all. I just had one drink with my friends, then my wife kicked me out of the house. I thought I could do it all, so I got to this life, he sighed, and how did you do? I was pretty much the same, I had everything, I didn't appreciate anything. Carlos imagined it as if it were real and he was scared. By evening they said goodbye and he drove back to his friend. So, did you like it? He wondered. I did, it was so romantic, he told him. Carlos changed his clothes again and went home. You, what do you smell? Juliet recoiled from him. I played a little game that an old acquaintance of mine gave me, he admitted to her. What kind of game? She didn't understand. I'll tell you later. He didn't want to tell her. Carlos went to the bathroom, took a shower, came out, went into the kitchen. Wife, what are we having for dinner tonight? He was hungry as a hungry wolf. Carlos ate. He immediately felt better. He didn't know why, but he really liked this game. He was ready to play it again. But now he was already playing the game himself. He would change his clothes and go to some unfamiliar neighborhood. No one would recognize him in the clothes he was wearing, and it amused him. His wife never figured it out, and Carlos never told her. Where are you all the time? she tell him. I work, he just tell her. What kind of work do you have that stinks? Your clothes don't wash, she told him. Leave it to the machine, Carlos said, even though he had long thought that after each walk he should throw them away. Now every day he changed into some old clothes that he had specially ordered on websites, stained them, and went for a walk. On the street he met all sorts of people, had a drink with them, talked about life. So how are things going there? Carlos asked his old acquaintance. Everything's fine, he waved his hand at him. Are the dogs growing? Last time he told him that the bitch where he works had gotten pregnant. Of course they're growing, two are dead and six are left. Do you need a dog by any chance? Bernard asked. No, Carlos answered him, I don't need a dog. He smiled to himself, wondering what his wife would think if he came home with a dog. So, every day he walked around the city, not touching anyone, trying to get warm somewhere, somewhere to eat. It was even interesting. It was like he was still playing the game. Juliet was building her career. She had already managed to work as the head of a kindergarten, and then she was put in charge of another one. And then she was promoted to deputy head. Are you happy now that your dream has come true? Carlos asked her one day. Of course, what a leap up the career ladder, she made big eyes. Say, but if you were approached by a homeless person, would you help him? My husband wondered, 
Why such questions? She did not understand. Just so, decided to ask. He looked at her point blank. I do not know. Depending on what question would be addressed, she shrugged her shoulders. Well, I'd ask for food or money, he suggested. I don't know, but you'd help. She turned the tables on him. I think I would, he averted his eyes. I see you've been hanging out with them a lot, she told him, revealing that she knew a lot about him. Bernard, whom he now met almost every day, invited him to a party. I didn't know homeless people had holidays too, Carlos was surprised. Do you still have any change, by any chance? His new friend asked him. Carlos took some money with him, so that he wouldn't starve like last time. So he went out, and they didn't even give him any tea, so he came home hungry as a wolf. The days were already warmer, so the men went under the bridge. There in an iron barrel they made a fire, took out what they had. Carlos bought sausages, bread, and a bottle of vodka. Oh wow, we're living today, rubbed hands with those who were with him today. A little bit of money, he said. So, who has anything else? They asked each other, but no one else had anything except small bottles of vodka from the drugstore. As they talked, Carlos didn't notice how drunk he was getting. He was almost out of his mind. It was getting late, and he felt his feet were freezing. Hey, get up, he heard someone slapping his cheeks. Aha, he mumbled. After that, he was loaded into some car, taken somewhere, and then he found himself in the police station. He was thrown on a hard bench, and Carlos was still awake for a long time. When he woke up, it was daytime outside, so either he'd been in the dumpster all night or he'd slept here. Hey, warden, he called out to the man in the uniform. Sit there and shut up, he snapped at him. Look, I'm entitled to one call. Let me call and they'll come get me right away. Pay you whatever you want. Carlos said, Tom Lolling. What do you think you are, a millionaire? The staff laughed at him. Let me make a call, he told them. Well, shall we? One looked at the other. He didn't even have a phone with him, said one employee to another. Well, give me yours, he asked. Well, let's give it to him, at least let's make fun of this bum. It was obvious that they had nothing to do. They handed him the phone behind bars. He immediately dialed his home number. Hello, Juliet. Hi, can you come for me? He gave her the address of the department, but before that he asked the staff. What she answered him, they did not hear, but they laughed for a long time. Now another homeless woman will come to help out her lover, one teased. How dare you insult my wife? She works in the administration, Carlos said. Ah, and I am the Pope, laughed even harder young people. She'll come and you'll see for yourself, he told them. What an ambitious homeless man we got, the staff said among themselves. An hour passed, two, three, but no one came. So, where's your Juliet? Is she still coming? They were still laughing at him. She's coming and you'll be amazed at who my wife is, Carlos told them. His head ached, his stomach twisted, he couldn't stand to be here waiting for her. The door slammed, a woman entered the room. Hello, I need to pick up my husband, she said. The duty officer looked at her and could not believe his eyes. In front of him stood the first deputy mayor. Are you sure your husband is here? He asked her. He recently called me and dictated this address. She pressed her lips. She could not stand and wait. Okay, go this way. He showed her the direction. Julia walked down the corridor, entered the office, sat down opposite the young man. Hello, what did you want? He looked at her. I came to pick up my husband, he called me three hours ago, she repeated to him again. Probably you are mistaken, your husband is not here, there is only some homeless man, whom we picked up on the street at night, drunk and barefoot, he told her. Can I see him, she asked. Yes, of course, the employee was very surprised, they walked over to where Carlos was. Juliet saw him, stood with her arms at her sides. What do you call this, she asked. Juliet. Let's get to the house and there I'll explain everything to you, he told her. All right, get up. Let's go. Let him go, she addressed the lawman. You need to write a statement, he told her. All right, let's go. I'll sign and fill everything out, she sighed and followed the young man. When all the paperwork was filled out, Carlos was released. For a long time, the staff looked after the couple leaving. Do you think it's really his wife or do you think they just know each other? One asked the other. Listen, are you interested? The other one asked him. Of course I'm interested, 
when he said he had the right to one call. We all laughed at him, and the deputy head came. How do you think such a woman could come for a homeless man? He reasoned. It doesn't matter. He was taken away and let them go, he said, and went to the seat. Well, what was it? They were sitting in the car. Juliet, it's a game, and you can say that I played it, he tried to explain. What kind of game? She didn't understand. This is the kind of game my friend dragged me into, and now I'm doing it myself. He didn't look at her. No, you explain to me why you're like that. You stink. You're not washed. You, she wrinkled her nose. I'm sorry, love. He wanted to hug her, but she pulled away. Come home, wash up. Then we'll talk about forgiveness, she said squeamishly. Okay, he agreed with her. Now it was necessary to be decent for a while to make it up to his wife. Carlos tried his best at everything, but he was still drawn to walking around the city at night in rags so no one would recognize him. He held on as long as he could. Alfred, would you like to go on an overnight fishing trip? Carlos asked his son one day. I want to, the boy looked at his mother, waiting for approval. What will you do there? She wondered. Nothing my father and I used to go like this very often, Carlos recalled. All right, you go and I'll take care of business, she agreed. From that moment on, they started traveling to rivers, forests, and other things. So, are you ready to go fishing? His father asked him. Always ready. He answered and laughed. Here you go, he gave him a shovel. What's that for? Alfred wondered. What for what and what are you going to do just like that? Without bait? Father was laughing now. Oh, I see, Alfred realized. So they began to spend many days and nights together. I like traveling with you so much, the son confessed to his father. And I like spending time with you, he told him. I used to be like that, with my father everywhere, Carlos told Alfred. We're men, he was having fun. Do you want me to put you in my business? Carlos asked. Sure, he'd been thinking about it for a long time. Well, in a couple of years, you'll be able to take over the business, his father promised him. I can't wait. That's when the fishing rod shook. Dad, it's biting, the boy whispered. Hush, don't move. He took the net and was ready to hook. There was a huge fish in the net. This is going to be our soup, Carlos laughed. He immediately remembered how hungry he had been when he walked around town in rags. He could use this fish then. The tent was standing. The fire was burning and all that was left was to pour water into the pot and hang it over the fire. Well, are you ready to peel potatoes? Father asked. Of course, Alfred took a knife and started peeling potatoes. Oh, this is going to make a shitza, Carlos said, anticipating the tasting. Yes, Alfred echoed him. Next time we'll go to the woods and we'll have pear cakes, his father told him. We will, his son agreed. They would return home happy and with a catch. Juliet was not at home. It is not known where she was. Carlos dropped everything. He decided to take care of the son. He did everything with him. Helped him with his homework, took him camping. He was always at the store with him. Son, if your mom and I get a divorce, will you stay with me or with her? His father asked him. What if you do? The boy looked at him with surprised eyes. No one knows what will happen next. Carlos was sure of it. I can't answer that question for you right now, but it's likely that I'll stay with you. He didn't look at him. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Carlos agreed with him. Juliet came home from work very late. She wasn't expecting it, but her husband was waiting for her in the kitchen. Why aren't you asleep? She wondered. I'm waiting for you. He looked up at her with tired eyes. Well, here I am, I came. She sat down on the chair opposite him. Where have you been? He asked her, looking his watch straight in the eyes. At work, Juliet sighed, while not looking at Carlos. I don't believe it. He shook his head. And believe me, you have no idea how much work I have. She got up to make herself some tea. I guess you and I are going to get a divorce, he said quietly. What? She asked it so loudly that Carlos even flinched. Why, you and I hardly see each other. We are each at our own jobs, he told her. What are you talking about? You and I have a child together. Julia was startled. So what? He's with me all the time. Carlos had excuses for everything. Then I'm suing, the woman said. Fine, then I'll counter sue. Carlos agreed with her. Do what you want, but you're a simple businessman, and I'm practically a government official, so I don't know which side the law will be on. 
Juliet stood up from the table. She was sure that the child would be left with her, because first of all, children are not often left with their fathers, and secondly, all the rights are on her side. All right, all right, think of it this way, he smiled. The very next day, Juliet went to court to file for divorce, division of property, and who the child would stay with. Carlos did the same thing. They were told the hearing would be within a month. Dad, like I said, I want to stay with you. Alfred came to him and sat down next to him. I would like that too, but now it all depends on what the court decides, he told him. I hope he will consider my opinion, hoped the boy. You will definitely be asked, his father was sure of it. The trial took place three weeks later. Carlos' side was heard first, followed by Juliet. And now I invite the boy himself. Alfred came out and stood behind the podium. Tell me, who did you want to stay with? The judge asked him. I would like to stay with my father, but I feel sorry for my mother too. He looked at her. At that moment, the woman cried. So you still have to make a decision, the judge insisted. So I stay with the father. Julia sat and could not believe her ears. She thought that her connections and everything else would help her to keep the child. And Carlos sat there thinking that his money would help keep the baby with him. And now when he heard Alfred say he wanted to stay with his father, it was like a balm to his soul. The three of them went home together. I think I'm expecting a child again, she said. And you're sure it's mine? He looked at her. Of course, I had no one else but you and work, the woman told him. Why did we go for this divorce then? He didn't understand. I thought you wouldn't go all the way. She wouldn't look him in the eye. Are we going to have a baby? He asked her. Yes, I would like this child. Alfred at this point heard the conversation between mom and dad and was glad to himself that they were not splitting up. The family arrived home. Everything seemed to be the same as before, only Juliet was constantly unwell. Carlos was by her side all the time. She was home more and more often because she was having a hard time. Who would have thought that we would have to get a divorce and divide the property to get things going again? Carlos laughed. They continued to live together, but things weren't the same anymore. You know, you're like my best friend now. Juliet told him. No, best friends don't give birth to children, he answered her laughing. Carlos decided to go back to the old games again. His son was getting older and he wanted to share with him. Alfred, do you want to play a game with me? He asked him one day. What kind of game? The boy was interested. We put on all kinds of rags, leave all the things at home, as well as money, go to the streets of the city. We need to survive at least two days and not starve to death. He told him the rules. What kind of game is this? He didn't understand. You'll see, you'll like it, his father said. By this time, Juliet was in the hospital. She didn't know what Carlos was up to. They were back on the city streets. The man took the boy where he knew he was going. It was summer outside. His old acquaintances were under the bridge. Oh, what people and no guards, they greeted him. Yes, you played a good joke on me last time. He remembered the last time they had celebrated here. Come on, don't mind. Things happen in life, they laughed. Alfred looked at all this. He didn't like it much. Dad, why don't we go home? He told him. Come on, it's just beginning, Carlos said. They saw that those who were already here had fun fairs again. The fun began. Carlos, don't be shy, Bernard told him, and Carlos relaxed as much as he could. While Juliet was lying in state, father and son managed to get out on the streets of the city three times. Thanking his friends today, Carlos put the money and everything else in his pockets. He also took his cell phone with him. Juliet was due back in the morning, so he didn't want to upset her. Hi, they met at the train station with some friends. Wow, what a dandy, they were surprised to see their old acquaintance. It's okay, I'll buy you a drink tonight. He showed them the money. They got on the train, the man wanted to take them out of town for a civilized walk. Now we will come, you will see how good everything is there, the master of life told his friends. They arrived at a small house that Carlos had rented. They made themselves comfortable there. The friends, who had never seen such a thing, immediately scattered to the corners. I invite you to the table, Carlos shouted to them. All gathered around the table, it was fun and heartwarming. I want to raise my glass to you. Carlos said the first toast, and we to you. They looked at him and didn't understand why he was driving them around. Juliet was at home. She asked her son where his father was. Do you know what games he plays? 
Alfred looked at her. No, she stared at the boy. He disguises himself as a homeless person and then walks under the bridge with others like him. Alfred told her. Here we go again, she sighed. Today, he took money and a phone from home to celebrate and thank his friends, her son kept telling her. God, this has happened before and I had to bail him out, and now I don't even know she waved her hands. Have to bail him out? Alfred became concerned. We should call him, she said and picked up the phone, but it was disconnected. I know where he went because I was supposed to be with him. The son got up from his chair and went into the kitchen. There was an address written down on a piece of paper. I can't go there, she looked at her big belly. Then I'll go, Alfred stood up in the hallway. No, I won't let you go alone. The time was getting late. They sat and waited and Carlos still never came back. Meanwhile, things were going terribly wrong outside the city. Carlos had had so much to drink that he couldn't stand up now. The rest of the group went through the man's pockets, took off his watch and shoes. Then they moved on to the house. They took all the valuables from there too, and then they just walked out the gate. Carlos saw this. He tried to follow them, but he could only get out of the gate. That's where he was picked up by the village security. Look, the homeless have gotten into this house again, and why are they so fond of it? Said one man to another. Come on, let's load this one. He pointed at Carlos. They loaded him into the car and drove him to the nearest station. No, he stinks. They were cursing in the car. Don't tell me. I better drop him off soon or the whole car will stink. The other one answered him. Soon they were near the station. They unloaded the man, took him to the duty officer's window and got into the car and drove away. Oh, we have company. One of the officers noticed Carlos. Eek. He was sitting up against the wall. Come on, get up. Let's go. One of the employees on Dewey took him under the elbow. Let go, he jerked. Oh, we can talk, laughed the employee. I'm a respectable man, Carlos said. Me too. The man nodded his head and looked at his bare feet. Let me make a phone call. He started yelling at the entire squad. I'm entitled to a phone call. All right, you'll get a call. They tried to calm the guest down. I need a phone. He started patting his pockets. Where'd you get those clothes? The guys asked him. These are my clothes, eek. They shoved him into a cell. Okay, let me put it another way. Where did you find them? The man in the uniform was looking at him. I didn't find it anywhere. He couldn't focus his eyes on them. Then what? The officers wouldn't leave the bars. I was drugged. Carlos sat on a bench. Yeah, yeah. We hear that every day. They laughed at him. Let me make a phone call, he begged them. Okay, Don, now it was just wondering who he would dial. Carlos picked up the phone, looked at the buttons for a long time, and then dialed the phone number. Hello, Juliet. I'm in a bind again, he told his ex-wife. And again with the homeless, she guessed. No, I'm alone, he stood with his back to the staff. Dictate the address, but I can't come get you myself, she told him. After Carlos asked and dictated the address, she told him that she would call someone she knew to pick him up. That's it. They're coming for me now. He handed the phone back. Who the wife? They asked. No, an acquaintance of hers, he said. Okay, we'll wait. They looked at each other. Carlos waited too. He didn't know what acquaintances the wife had. He thought she would call someone she knew. But after a couple of hours, the employee who gave him the phone rang again. For you. He put Carlos on the phone. Yet, he listened to what his wife was telling him. I couldn't reach anyone. The head of our town decided to help me, she said. Well, I won't be in debt, Carlos said, and hung up. So how long do we have to wait? They were tired of listening to this man's nonsense. No, the president is coming for me now, Carlos answered proudly. Why not the president? They laughed. Because my wife is not his deputy, he turned away from them. Yeah, the head is coming for him and he is also from the homeless. They laughed even more. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Carlos paid no attention to them. He sat in the cage, even managed to nod off. And then the door opened, and Jack appeared on the threshold. Well, who's here to help? He came through. Hello, looked in all eyes, and could not believe that their head really came for Carlos. Hello, hello, he looked at them. Jack, I'm here. Carlos shouted to him through the bars. Carlos, Let's go home. Your wife is waiting for you. He hurried him. The officers on duty didn't ask him to fill out any documents. They issued a fine and let the man go. 
Wow, you and I were laughing, wondering if anyone would find out. They looked at each other. Thank you, Jack. Carlos thanked the man. You can save your thanks for later, but now tell me what happened to you. They got in the car. You see, I play this game where I dress up as a beggar and wander around town, and this is the second time I've been caught. And when they come after me, first Juliet and now you, the officers are dumbfounded that the homeless have such friends. Consider it the first and last time he wasn't looking at him. Yes, yes, thank you. I vowed even then that such a thing would not happen again. He did not want to justify himself to this man. They drove home in silence, not wanting to talk about anything. Will you take me to play your game? Jack asked suddenly. I don't know, but if I do, I don't think I'll be lucky again the third time he was afraid. Yes, how do you didn't get cold or any disease? The man wondered. I'm surprised I almost got my son involved, Carlos lamented. Okay, if you get a chance, dial right away, Jack smiled at him. Thank you again, he got out of the car and headed for the driveway. Good luck, say hi to your wife, shouted the man to him. Goodbye, Carlos looked back. He was on his way home, and everything was churning inside. Julia was going to interrogate him, and he didn't want that. I'm home, he walked in. Funny. Juliet came out to greet him. He stood in front of her barefoot, in pants and jacket. I'm sorry, he wanted to hug her, but she deflected from him. For what? She looked at her ex-husband. For everything. Let's get married again, he waited for her answer. Don't you have enough adventure in your life? She grinned. Yes, that's why I make them up for myself, he laughed too. Is that why you invented divorce? She guessed. Perhaps the man took a step toward her again. I'm going to have a baby soon, she touched her stomach. Here we'll get married before that happens, they were still standing in the hallway. Alfred heard all this and was happy for mom and dad. He crossed his fingers that mom would say yes. Okay, I promise to think about it tonight, she promised him. Thank you, now I'm going to the bathroom. He walked past her and closed himself in the bathroom. He stayed in there for an hour or so, trying to wash himself properly. After that he went out, Everyone in the apartment was asleep. He lay down next to Juliet, even though they'd slept separately before. What are you doing? She turned to him. Just decided it was time to reunite, he hugged her. Okay, I agree, she allowed it. When's the wedding? He smiled. I don't know, as soon as so soon, she said. Alfred would be pleased, her father knew that for sure. Yes, why they had to get divorced, Juliet didn't understand. Carlos didn't understand it either. The next day Carlos and Juliet went to the registry office, filed an application and were given a date in two weeks. They decided to do just a signing so that there would be a document. Juliet bought herself a light-colored maternity dress. She was happy again. Do you agree? The receptionist said. Of course, the groom looked at Juliet with loving eyes. And you, bride, was looking at her now. Yes, she was smiling through her teeth. In the presence of witnesses, your marriage is registered at which point the only witness, in the person of Alfred, clapped his hands. And now, young ones congratulate each other with a kiss. Carlos and Juliet kissed each other. I am so happy that you are together again, Alfred hugged them. Son, they hugged him too. After that, they went to a restaurant together to celebrate the event. And there Juliet became ill and was hospitalized. Darling, we'll come tomorrow, Carlos told her. I'll be waiting. She wrinkled her nose in pain. But no visitors were needed for tomorrow, because during the night, Juliet went into premature labor. Ah, screamed the mommy-to-be. Be patient, sweetheart, the midwife told her. I can't, Juliet wrinkled her nose. But you have to, she stroked her and made her breathe. By morning, a very weak baby was born and immediately taken to a special ward. What will you call him so we can call him by his name? They asked the mother. Jervis, she had thought of the name a long time ago fine they left. And when Julia was able to get up on her own, she too was escorted to where her baby was now. He was small, covered in tubes. But she was told, Juliet, I'm sorry for everything. He hugged her. What's gotten into you? She looked at him and smiled. Everything is fine. I, while you were in the hospital, I thought over everything, how I behaved, my behavior, and decided that now everything will be different. He took his son in his arms. Now Carlos took care of his son all day long. He took him for walks, 
He bathed him. He played with his toys. Juliet only fed him and got up to him at night. When Jervis was six months old, Juliet decided to go to work. I can't stay at home anymore, she told her husband. Yes, of course. If you want to go out, I'll take care of him, he said. The boy had already been given complimentary foods, so there were no problems with nutrition. Juliet had gone to work, and now she was staying out late. I get the feeling you don't want to come home, Carlos told her one day. Carlos, you're starting again. I have a lot of work to do while I was on maternity leave. Nobody did anything. So now I have to do everything, the woman said. I understand, but you're not alone now. You have a big family, he told her. I know that, she lowered her eyes. Carlos spent more and more time alone with the children. He made sure Alfred and Jervis had everything. If the older son helped in any way, the younger son was just a distraction. Juliet, I want us to spend this weekend together as a family, Carlos once told his wife. I can't, I have work, she only answered. If I had known it would be like this, I would never have let you leave the maternity leave so early, he lamented. What's wrong with it? She didn't understand. Everything dislikes that you don't spend time with your family but only with your work, he resented. It's work, and there's nothing you can do about it, she answered him always the same way. Jervis had to go to kindergarten, and Carlos took him there too. That's where he met Selena. Hi, are you Jervis' daddy? She asked him that day. Yeah, had he done something wrong? Carlos was concerned. No, I just want to tell you that you have a wonderful boy. She walked next to him from kindergarten. From that point on, Carlos and Selena started hanging out. It turned out that they lived in the same neighborhood, so now they were walking the kids together, taking them to the garden, and bringing them back from the garden. Where do you disappear in the evenings with the baby? Julia was curious. She had been coming home early from work for several days, and her husband was not at home. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I met another woman, he told her then. What? And you're telling me this out in the open? She glared at him. How was I supposed to tell you about it? Hide it? He didn't understand. I don't know. Tears came to the woman's eyes. Alfred had already finished the ninth grade. After that, he was going to enter, and for that, he had to go to another city. You won't see your son. Don't even dream about it, Juliet said about the younger one. What are you talking about? Again began the quarrel between husband and wife. That's what I'm saying. I was with him all this time. Why should I give him to you? They argue for hours. Stop arguing. Better talk about your relationship and find out, Alfred approached him. And you, even though you're an adult, you're still a little boy, his father told him. Yes, but I love you both, I think, as well as Jervis, so I have the right to give advice, said the older son in response to this remark. Carlos left his wife for a couple of days. He rented an apartment. He needed to think things over. He had been seeing Selena all these days. The two of them were good together. Are we going to be together? She asked him. I think so, but first we have to settle the issue with Juliet and the sons, he told her seriously. Do you think I want your children? She looked at him with big eyes. What are you saying? I will not leave my children. He was shocked by such words, Veda. She saw that he from birth with the boys together and now will not be able to leave them. That's what I'm saying. I have my own children to raise, she carried. Why should I raise your children and you say that about mine? He didn't understand. That's it. The conversation is over. I haven't come to that yet. She turned away from him. Their conversations always ended this way. Were you at her place again? Juliet would ask at home when he went back there. You don't have to worry about that. Carlos answered her gruffly. Also, then I'm filing for divorce again. She was angry beyond belief. Well then, just like the first time, you won't see the children, he promised her. We'll see about that, they argued. You've started again. Alfred couldn't believe it. Jervis was too young to understand. Alfred, who are you staying with this time? Carlos was curious. I do not change my decisions, and I have to leave soon. So it turns out that with no one, he concluded. That's great. Carlos rubbed his hands together. I don't see anything great. I'll sue for Jervis, Juliet said. It would work out just like the first time. Carlos knew for sure. Once again, they both applied and were now awaiting trial. The session was held. Alfred, when asked, said he would stay with his father. His mother looked at him 
and thought he had said that last time too. But Alfred didn't look at her, and this time he didn't think his parents would try it on again. Selena was sitting in the audience. She was smiling, which really pissed Juliet off. The court ruled the children are to be left with their father. Bang the judge's gavel. How can that be? Juliet jumped to her feet. Out of the question, that was the end of the trial. Both women were unhappy. One didn't want to accept this child and the other didn't want to give it away. I'm very glad it's over like this, Carlos said to Selena. I'm not, she was telling the truth. It's okay, you'll get used to it. He saw Juliet crying on the sidelines, but he didn't even go near her. She was the first to start this war. Good, she was willing to do anything as long as the man was with her. We'll have to move, he told her. I'll do anything, she confirmed his thoughts. Then let's start dealing with the sale of the apartment, he decreed everything. They contacted a realtor who helped them in buying and selling apartments, everything had to happen quickly. And already Carlos and Selena were buying a new place. But before they did, they signed to make it fair. I'm so happy, Selena told him. And I'm happy too, he echoed her. Carlos realized that this woman was different from Juliet, more caring and more in love with him. But it didn't happen with their children. Selena didn't accept his children, and he couldn't get used to her offspring. Jervis was growing up. It was time to go to school. Alfred was studying in another city. He was supposed to become a lawyer. Because of their distance, the brothers grew distant from each other. They practically did not communicate, also because the older one went to his mom and dad. He couldn't single out one of them. I'm being transferred to another city, Selena said one day. Does that mean I have to leave my business here and the kids have to change schools? Carlos told her. It turns out that's what she was adamant about. Good, then have a family council, her husband told her. They decided that no one was against the change, and a few weeks later, the apartment was put up for sale. With the help of the same realtor, they managed to sell and buy an apartment in the city where Selena was transferred. No one regretted anything. Only Carlos was uncomfortable now. He traveled to that city every week to do audits or deliver goods. Why don't you put your director in charge of all this? Selena didn't understand. Look, you have your job, I have mine, so you do it and I'll do mine. The man told the woman. The children were growing up. The parents were not getting any younger. Jervis was already in the fifth grade. And Alfred by this time had already graduated from the institute and went to undergo an internship in a law firm. He was doing well, his mentors praised him. He had a dream to defend the poor and those who cannot afford to hire an expensive lawyer. Many twisted his finger at the temple, telling him that it was not profitable at all. But Alfred did not listen to anyone. He was a frequent visitor to his father's house, but he did not forget about his mother. He came to see both him and her. Jervis, get ready, you're late for school, Selena told the boy. I know it myself, he put on his sneakers. Don't be rude, she yelled at him. Back off, he couldn't listen to her admonishment. All right, I'm off, but don't you ever talk to me again. She never got used to the boy. The only time Jervis was happy was when his older brother came to visit. Then they'd go out, socialize. The younger one could share anything with the older one. Does she hurt you? Alfred asked him. Not physically, but morally. The boy was silent. Don't be patient, answered. He advised him. All right, nodded the younger brother. So they could talk for hours, walking on the street. Bye, come back more often, Jervis asked. I try, but I can't always make it, Alfred answered. They were apart for a week or two. During this time, his younger brother was very ill. But the worst started when he was in high school. Selena, I don't feel well, Carlos called out to her. What's wrong? She came running into the room. I don't know, he was lying on the floor. Get up, she begged him. I can't, he only moved his eyes. Now she tried to lift him herself, but he was so heavy she couldn't even lift him. Selena called an ambulance. They came quickly, loaded Carlos on a stretcher, and took him to the hospital. Doctor, what's wrong with him? Selena came to get him. He's having a stroke. He needs surgery and then care, he told the woman. This is bad. She immediately thought of the children and the business. The surgery was scheduled for a day later. Selena wasn't promised anything good afterward. It was possible that the facial nerve would be hit, and it was possible that paralysis would occur, the doctor told her. Okay, I hear you, Selena was afraid of it, but she didn't show it. 
She disappeared to the hospital. She neglected everything. She took a leave of absence from work. Selena, what about your father? Alfred called her. He had a seizure, she said and cried into the phone. How, after all he is not so many years old, was surprised by the guy. I don't know, I found him already at home on the floor, she said. Okay, as soon as I can, I'll come right away, said the guy. I'll be waiting. And then Alfred called to say that his mother had also gone to the hospital with a seizure. Some kind of attack, Selena said. By now Carlos had already had surgery, just as the doctor had said. He was paralyzed on one side. Now he couldn't walk or talk, and they brought him home lying down. Jervis was in ninth grade at the time. Since your father can't do anything on his own anymore, you'll have to do everything on your own, his stepmother told him. What do you mean by that? He didn't understand. That you should go to the orphanage, she was sure of her words. What are you saying? It's my father and we share the apartment too. Jervis started to defend himself. I don't know anything after your father is gone. He doesn't have any wills, so I'm the first Harris and you are afterward. She was unapproachable. And then Alfred called to say that his mother had also gone to the hospital with a seizure. Some kind of attack, Selena said. By now, Carlos had already had surgery, just as the doctor had said. He was paralyzed on one side. Now he couldn't walk or talk, and they brought him home lying down. Jervis was in ninth grade at the time. Since your father can't do anything on his own anymore, you'll have to do everything on your own, his stepmother told him. What do you mean by that? He didn't understand. That you should go to the orphanage, she was sure of her words. What are you saying? It's my father and we share the apartment too. Jervis started to defend himself. I don't know anything after your father is gone. He doesn't have any wills, so I'm the first Harris and you are afterward. She was unapproachable. Okay, you'll regret it, he promised her, and packed up his own things and left the house. The guy was proud. He didn't want to ask anyone for help. Hi, he dialed Alfred's brother's number. Jervis, I don't have time for this yet. He answered him and hung up. Okay, the guy took offense to that too. Alfred called him back later, but he didn't answer him himself. He didn't want to humiliate and distract him. Jervis didn't wait for Selena to call, or worse, to take him to an orphanage or boarding school. He went there himself. Hello, he said as he entered the gate. Who are you here to see? They asked him. And then Jervis told what had happened to his father and that he had made the decision to come here on his own. Well, come on in, the teacher was surprised at the boy's courage. He settled in the room he was shown. Now he had a roof over his head, fed, taught. But all this did not last long. Why did you leave home? Selena texted him. Because of you. He answered her just once. And at home, it was like nothing you could wish on an enemy. Carlos was lying down. He kept looking at the door to Jervis' room and mooing. What are you mooing for? He's not there. He's out of the house, his wife told him. Mmm, he mooed harder. That was the end of the conversation. She didn't want to talk to him anymore. Mom, why don't you put him in some kind of hospital? The children asked her. She wagged her finger at them because she realized that Carlos understood everything. And Alfred, at this moment, was taking care of his mother, who was as sick as his father, and he was also providing the store with food and things to sell. He realized he needed to call back, or better yet, drive over to his brother's house, but he couldn't do it. Jervis, call me, he texted him, but got nothing in return. They hadn't spoken in months, which made it even harder. Mommy, I have to go away, Alfred told her. Okay, she said on an exhale. She felt just as bad, but better than her father. But Alfred never managed to leave, one thing or another, so he stayed here. He was planning to go tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but he had something to do, and everything broke down. He could not tear himself between it all, work, mother, and he met a girl. Now there was no time at all, not even to call this brother. What are you looking at me for? Selena said to her husband. And he just looked at her and said nothing because he couldn't. He had been lying down for so long that everything had atrophied. I wish you would die soon, his wife said to him. She was fed up with everything. The children had left to study, and now she was alone with her husband at home. She had to feed him and clean up after him. Jervis had finished 11 grades. He was going to be an auto mechanic. He decided that a long time ago, but the first thing he got was a summons to the army. 
he decided not to invite anyone and not to tell anyone about it. He just sat with the guys he met at the orphanage. The next day, he went to the train station. A guy got into the Air Force, which was good. Hi, approached him one of the guys when he arrived at the training center. Hi, he gave him his hand. Let's be friends, my name's David, he said. Mine's Jervis, he nodded at him. From then on, they started sticking together everywhere. The service went easily, the guys even liked it here. Time flew by quickly. Everything was almost the same as in the orphanage, except for outfits, exercises, and other things. How did you get to the orphanage? Carlos asked him. It's a sad story. I don't want to remember it, he said. All right, I won't bore you, he agreed. They were together all the time, almost never parted. When it was time to go back, they agreed to meet in a few months. Jervis went back to this town and got into the school he wanted to go to. You're smart, his teacher said. Thank you. He wanted to visit his father so badly, but he didn't want to meet Selena. He went to school, and then he got an internship at a car dealership. Come work for us after your studies, one of the foremen told him after his internship. Sure, he would have asked if he had been called. The boy continued his apprenticeship. He still didn't know what happened to his father, mother, and brother. He had seen Alfred's picture in the papers a couple of times, and they said he was a great lawyer and helped the poor. Only to hire him, you had to have connections or know the guy well. Jervis was happy for him. After graduation, Jervis went where he was called. Since his parents were alive, he didn't get an apartment. So the guy was left with nothing. He'd never go back to Selena. And where is your registration? They asked him when he got a job. I have a temporary one, he lied. Where is it? The HR girl was waiting for him to answer. I don't know, he shrugged his shoulders. Then we can't accept you, she said regretfully. Okay, he stood up and walked towards the exit. Why didn't you stay? Asked him the same foreman who had invited him before. I don't have a residence permit, he said honestly. Will you come to my team? I'll take you on a contract. He asked him, can I do that? He wasn't sure. Of course, at your own risk, said the master. Then I'll go, he nodded his head. From that moment, they started working together. Where did you take that to? Jervis asked John when he saw that he had a bag full of spare parts, not tools. Quiet. He put his finger to his lips, working here and not stealing. It's no respect for yourself. Okay, the guy thought. That's just the way it is around here. After he saved up some money, he was able to buy himself an old car. And then he started carrying parts to build a good car out of the hull. So, one day the most senior boss came to them. Everyone gathered, didn't know what the occasion was but they guessed. So we got a rat, or rather, Nesson, said the chief. And we even know who it is. All eyes were on Jervis. You sure it's you? The man was surprised. What are you doing to me? He tried to get out of it. Here, open the toolbox. It was time to go home, and it was just about time to fill those boxes. The guy got up, went to his drawer, opened it, and clearly there were various spare parts in there. Aren't you ashamed? We hired you without documents, and you do this to us. The supervisor was telling him. Again, Jervis was ashamed. He was ready to fall under the ground. Ashamed, he tilted his head. All right, I'm calling the police, so the others don't get hurt. The warden took his cell phone out of his pocket. Maybe you shouldn't. The guy looked at him. I'll get it back. You'll get it back. You're not going anywhere. He nodded his head, at that moment dialing a number. The law enforcement officers arrived quickly. They took a statement and arrested the guy. They brought him to the station. Even though I'm homeless, I'm still entitled to one phone call, he told them. What else are you entitled to? They laughed. A lawyer. He didn't look embarrassed. Oh, that's funny. The cops clutched their stomachs. Are you going to let me make the call or not? He waited. Jervis was given a phone and quickly dialed Alfred's number. Hello, Alfred answered quickly. Brother, hello. I need your help, he spoke quickly. Okay, where are you and what's wrong with you? The man asked. Jervis explained everything to him. The latter was shocked. They hadn't seen each other for so many years and only now he would find out everything. I'll be there soon, he promised him. So, is your lawyer on his way to see you yet? The policemen were still laughing. Yes, replied the guy calmly. Good, then we wait. They sat down and watched the entrance. Alfred was still gone. It was understandable. 
He had to put all his business aside and come to another city. He's definitely coming. Jervis saw the disbelief in the policemen's faces. Aha! Suddenly the wizard will come in a blue helicopter. They began to sing a well-known song. At that moment, the doors opened and Alfred entered the room. The policemen immediately got up from their seats. They recognized him. How many homeless people he had already helped. There was no counting. I'm taking him into custody, he said, pulling out some documents and putting them on the table. Good, but there's a report on him, the officers explained. We'll sort it out, Alfred said. They left the department building together, got into Alfred's car. Why didn't you call earlier? He asked his brother. I called, you didn't answer, Jervis said calmly. But I called back so many times afterward, the older man wanted to cry. Apparently, at that moment, I had no time, said the brother. What about dad? Where is he now? Alfred had a lot of questions. I don't know. I haven't seen him in years, Jervis admitted. All right, let's go to them. Alfred started the car. They arrived at a familiar house, got out of the car, entered the entrance. What are you doing? Alfred didn't understand why Jervis had stopped. I did not want to see her. She broke my whole life, he said honestly. Why didn't you call? sighed Alfred. I told you before, I called, you didn't answer. That's all. And with those words, they rang the doorbell. Who? They heard Selena's voice. Open up, Alfred said sternly. Oh, what people, she turned the lock and you're here. The brothers entered the apartment. It smelled of urine. Yo, the boys wrinkled their noses. It's all your father, she said. Jervis and Alfred walked into the room. Carlos was lying on the bed. He looked really bad. One eye was bulging out. The other one was badly closed. Hi, Dad, they said almost in chorus. He doesn't recognize anyone. Selena stood there. You should have gotten a man like that, Jervis said in a whisper. We're taking him away, said Alfred. Oh, good. My suffering will finally be over. The woman exhaled. An ambulance had been called because the guys didn't know if they could transport the man in a simple car. Now they were going to the town where Julia was. She was sick too. But she was better than her ex-husband. I'm not allowed to drive out, Jervis said. It's okay. We'll be here again by morning. We'll solve all the issues and everything will be fine. His brother encouraged him. They drove their car, followed by an ambulance with their father in it. They arrived home two and a half hours later. Julia looked as if she had been waiting for them. Mom, hello, and we brought your father to you. Alfred was the first to enter. He saw the woman's eyes widen. Keep in mind that you need special equipment for him, and it is better to invite a doctor, advised the nurse. Okay, we'll keep that in mind, Alfred thanked him. The boys spent the whole night with their parents. They set up the bed, persuaded their mother that it would be better for them. They packed up in the morning and drove back, because Jervis had a recognizance. Two weeks later, the guy had a trial. Naturally, Alfred was ready for it, so he had no trouble winning the case. Jervis was released in the courtroom and all charges were dropped. Now, what did I tell you? They were coming out of the courtroom. The same policemen who were there the night Alfred came to see Jervis were standing on the way out. They couldn't understand how an ordinary homeless man could call up such a tough lawyer. They didn't realize it was his own brother. All right, now go home. We have to sue Selena. The younger brother asked the older one. We'll definitely do that and we'll get dad on his feet and he'll take care of it. And now we have to get you a residence permit, Alfred said knowledgeably. Yes, Jervis agreed with him. They drove back to their town, and there they quickly took the house book and gave the registration papers to the boy. After that they invited the doctor, who said he would come every day and give Carlos a massage. It was good to know that he didn't say no. Julia could slowly move around the apartment. She took care of her ex-husband a little. In the meantime, Alfred took over his father's stores. There was no one to bring goods to them, and no time, so they vacated the pavilions and rented them out. Good thing they were in the center of town. Things seemed to be getting better, Jervis told his brother. We should have just reconnected, he hugged him. Yeah, he agreed. Jervis had vacated his father's garage and opened a tire shop there, and in a short time he had a lot of customers. He had money now, and he could afford a lot of things. He and Alfred went after his parents together, spared nothing for them. Dad was slowly getting better. And what did I tell you that it was Svecka did not look after him? 
and did not go, and now, look at him. Soon he will start talking. Alfred was happy for his father. Yes, Jervis agreed with his brother. He worked hard, so he had both clients and finances. Are you doing all right? His brother often asked him. He was kicking himself now for leaving him with Selena and going away. He should have taken him back to his mother. It wouldn't be like this now. Yeah, better than okay, Jervis smiled. He had recently met a girl at a concert, and now he wanted to introduce her to Alfred. I see you got an apartment. They sat and talked with his brother. Yes, I'm with a girl now. We need our own nest, R said. It's all clear with you. Will you introduce me? Alfred laughed. Of course, he wanted to do it himself. I'll take mine, you take yours, and we'll go to a restaurant together. Alfred winked at his brother. Good, then we'll do it all this weekend. They were happy that they were together again and everything was going well. They shook hands and went their separate ways. Now they often met at their parents' house, their father was getting better, and their mother was getting better too. The brothers talked to each other every day now. On the weekend they, as agreed, took their girls to get acquainted in a restaurant. Catherine, Alfred's girlfriend, extended her hand. Victoria, the Jervis lady, introduced herself. Nice to meet you, Catherine smiled. Nice to meet you too, Victoria confirmed. They sat and chatted together. Why can we have a wedding on the same day? Asked his brother. Why not, he smiled. Girls, how about it? And we agree, we won't have to spend so much money, Victoria was practical. Indeed, Catherine agreed with her. On that and agreed, but only with the date was not determined, but it could be done later and later. The next day, the young people, all four of them, went to apply to the registry office. I can't wait for this very happy day to come, said one of the girls. And me too. They became best friends. Now Catherine and Victoria were everywhere together. They chose the menu, restaurant, dresses, and the guys were only happy for them because they were not distracted from their work. How good, we found them each other. Alfred said and laughed. Yes, Catherine has a friend now, and Victoria too, Jervis clarified. The boy's parents could both sit up already. The mother was even talking a little, but the father was only mooing so far. Why haven't we dealt with Selena yet, and she's still the father's wife? God forbid something happens to him, she'll get everything, and that's not fair, Jervis reasoned. Yes, it should be done, but for that it is necessary for the father to learn to speak at least, Halford shook his head. They had set the wedding date for late summer. Now it was only March, so there was still time. I'm so happy, each of the girls said to her chosen one. They echoed them, and even if everything in life was not as they wanted, but now everything was very good. The guys were working, earning a good income. There was also good money from renting out the pavilions, so the families were not poor. Alfred had started a court case about his father and Selena's divorce proceedings. And as much as the woman was against it, he wouldn't stop at anything. How dare you meddle in my life? The woman yelled at him. Believe me, this is our life too. And once she got into it, Alfred answered her. I won't give you anything. She was very angry. And no one will ask you. Everything will be decided by the court. With a little, the guy did not show her the tongue. I'll give you. She didn't know what else to say. Try it. The brothers laughed at her. What do you think? I'm weak, she yelled. Whatever, Jervis and Alfred were positively giddy. Once they'd made up their minds to take away all rights to property that didn't belong to her, so they did. The divorce took place, with Selena getting nothing of what belonged to her father. She screamed at the guys out of desperation. There was nothing she could do, and the kids couldn't help her. And Jervis and Alfred went back to their town and never thought of that woman again. Mommy, Daddy. Can't we go outside for a walk? The children asked Juliet and Carlos. Aha, uh -huh, they looked at them. Juliet could already move around on her own, but Carlos was only in a wheelchair. They go out to the yard, spend some time there, and then go back up to the house. While the sons were away, Carlos was followed by his ex-wife. They must have been made for each other, since it was the third time they came together, the brothers said about them. Anything is possible, their future wives agreed when they heard their story. They were preparing for the upcoming wedding, dresses and suits were ready, all that was left was to find a good venue. Friends and relatives were invited not a few, so they were looking for that it was convenient for everyone. Summer passed quickly, 
Here came the end of August. The wedding was to take place on the weekend. Juliet was almost healthy. Carlos also started to move. They were happy for their children. I'm so happy. Both brides to be said. They slept in one apartment tonight and the groomsmen in another. Are we all set? Alfred was worried. Yes, don't worry, his brother reassured him. Good, I'm not worried. They were already lying in their beds. The next day, everyone was near the house where Catherine and Victoria slept. Catherine, I love you, shouted first one groom. Victoria, I love you, as if the other repeated after him. The girls came out to them. All went to the registry office. Everything had been planned in advance, so there were no hitches now. It was nice to see that the groom's mother was also present. Yes, she is sitting, but it doesn't bother anyone. Do you agree? The registrar asked both couples at once. Yes, they shouted in unison. Then came the exchange of rings, the first dance, the rides, and then the restaurant. You don't know how happy I am, Victoria whispered. And I leaned to her Catherine. They stood next to their husbands and were so beautiful. When the congratulations began, the first to come out were Catherine's parents, then Victoria's, and after them Juliet and Carlos. He sat in the stroller and looked at the young ones. My children, I congratulate you, said the mother of the grooms a little inaudible. Aha, uh -huh, nodded the father. Thank you for being here today. A stingy male tear ran down his face. Thank you for everything, Juliet told them, and she cried too. She imagined that if there were no her children, there was no telling where she would be now. The party was over and everyone went home. Juliet and Carlos were home too. She carefully put her husband to bed, covered him with a blanket, and lay down next to him. How quickly life has gone by, she said to him. Aha, uh -huh, he told her and turned his head. Good night, she kissed him on the cheek and turned to the other side. A tear rolled down Carlos' cheek. The next day, the children had been at their house since morning. They thanked their parents for everything, and the Jervis informed them that they would soon be grandparents. What a joy it is, Juliet hugged her and her daughter-in-law. I never thought I would live to see this day. Everything will be fine, my father will be happy too, Alfred said. Aha, uh -huh. Carlos confirmed his words. They all sat together at the table. Afterwards, they went for a walk in the yard. It's good to be a family, the boys said. Yes, it's good to have a big family together. Juliet looked at her children, who were now twice as many. And soon there will be even more of us, Victoria said, and stroked her belly. That's great. What about you, Alfred? The mother looked at her eldest son. We are trying. They laughed together with his wife. That's good, Juliet nodded. Victoria's pregnancy was not going as easily as she would have liked. She thought that everything would be as it was at first. But already in the second trimester, the girl started to feel so malchist that she couldn't stand it. More and more often, Victoria spent time in bed because she felt bad. Two times she was lying on the preservation. And finally, this period came in a week she was to go into labor. Finally, this moment has come. She was writhing in pain, but still rejoiced at this moment of relief. Congratulations, you have a girl. They put the baby on her chest. Alice, she whispered and leaned back because her strength had completely run out. Just like Alice in Wonderland, said the midwife. Yes, and it is, said the girl, without opening her eyes. Had the father been told? The woman asked. Not yet, I can't reach the phone, she said. Here, take it, because they are already worried, she gave it to her. Thank you, Victoria dialed Jervis' number. Hi, my love, your daughter Alice was born, she told him. At that moment, the girl was taken away. I congratulate you and thank you, love, he cried. Why are you crying? She didn't understand. From happiness, he couldn't help himself. Victoria heard Alfred and Catherine congratulating her and also someone else whispering. My parents are here too, he told her. Good, tell them hello. And I need to call mine, she hummed up. Victoria dialed another number to tell her mom that she had become a grandmother. Daughter, I congratulate you. Maybe I should come over to help you with the baby, she suggested. No, I think we can manage, she stopped her. Okay, but when you need to, you be sure to call. She did not bother the one who had just become a mom anymore. After that call, Victoria was moved to a ward where other young moms were lying. Now she had a lot to learn. 
Jervis had been under the windows of the maternity hospital from morning till evening, until his wife and daughter were discharged. Congratulations, he told her again. Thank you. They were all together again, which couldn't have been more gratifying. Today, they went to Jervis' parents' apartment, stayed there for a while, and then headed back to their place. Surprisingly, Carlos spent almost the entire time with the girl on his lap. Victoria was so afraid he was going to drop her, but everything went fine. Well, now, if you take a walk, then come to us. We'll help, Juliet said presumptuously. Of course, the girl did not want to offend her. They drove home, now began a completely different adult life. I love you, her husband whispered to Victoria. Not you, but you, she corrected him. Yes, sorry, you, he stroked the bundle that was in his wife's hands. That's it, it's your turn now, Victoria told Catherine. Yes, we can only wait, nodded her friend. Now the men disappeared at work, and the girls were at home with little Alice. Do you think it will stick? Catherine asked her friend about folk omens. I think that yes, laughed that in response. They walked together with a stroller. Often it happened in the yard of her husband's parents, where they all breathed fresh air together. It's so good that we're all friends, Victoria said. She was standing under a tree, rocking the stroller. Suddenly, a woman appeared from the corner. Carlos' eyes got big. It was Selena. He pulled forward a little. What happened? Stared in the same direction Victoria was looking. It's his ex-wife. The one the guy sued everything from, Juliet explained. And what does she want here? The girl couldn't understand. Now we'll ask. The mother-in-law was not afraid of anything. Why did you come here? She came out to her. She came to Carlos and grabbed the handles of the stroller. You guess wrong. Juliet pushed her away. What? She didn't understand. What did you hear? He's my husband and he's staying with me. Look what you've brought him to. Juliet pushed her away. Let's go home. Victoria didn't wait for all this to end. As they approached the driveway, Jervis came around the corner. He saw Selena and his fists clenched. What does she want here? He approached Victoria and the parents. She came to get him. Juliet pointed at Carlos with her eyes. And what about you? He smiled. And even though the man can do nothing, and in a wheelchair, women continue to fight for him. Let's go home, Victoria repeated once again. I hate that woman with all my soul, and it was her fault that I became a homeless man. Jervis turned to her once again. That's all, it's in the past, and everyone knows who remembers the past to that eye out, said his wife. They went up the stairs, Jervis helping his father, Victoria carrying the baby and supporting her mother-in-law. When they were in the apartment, everyone laughed in the hallway, but everyone did it differently, damn it. If her grandmother had heard such a foul expression from her pupil's lips, she would have deprived her of sweets for a week and made her wash her mouth out with soap and water. But as the grandmother was fast asleep at the late midnight hour, Juliana remained unpunished. At last, having stopped pacing her room like a caged animal in a zoo, the young girl plumped down on the bed which squeaked pitifully with the shell netting, raked the teddy bear into a pile and burying herself in its worn chocolate-colored fur, silently wept. How? Well, how could she be such a fool, fall so low? However, Juliana's brain obligingly told her there was still time before the immediate fall, 21 hours and 30 minutes. The exact time was told to her by the dial of the alarm clock, on which she cast a tear-fog glance. It was in that time frame that she was to report to the hideous, impossible, heartless wretch in order to. It all happened ten days ago. Julian was in the school library where she had just returned the books she had read and had volunteered to help the old librarian, who was suffering from sciatica from the rainy weather, and was shelving them herself. You can't reach it, little one, came a mocking voice over her shoulder and the schoolgirl shrieked and turned around abruptly. Scared her? Because of the height difference, she jammed her nose into the voice owner's chest at armpit level. No, she answered sharply, and gritting her teeth, she looked up, glaring boldly and contemptuously. Alfred, the terror of the whole school, a bully and just the embodiment of all male vices. The distance between the shelves left no room for maneuvering, but Juliana still twisted, turned, sliding her side involuntarily on his thigh and stood on tiptoe, reached up a little more and the book about the lives of the greatest ancient Greek philosophers would be in place.
she decided that she would just ignore Alfred, shit on him, not this pleasure. Grandmother, by the way, even in her mind forbade swearing, but her granddaughter allowed herself to do it in her mind, because, yes, because life was such that sometimes got through on emotions and nothing could not be done about it. Julian repeated to herself that she didn't care, that he continued to stand behind her, probably squinting mockingly at her blue eyes, so piercing that he seemed to see right through you. There was a rustling sound as Alfred scratched the blonde back of his head. What an unseemly habit. And then he suddenly snatched the book from her, yanked it out of her hand, and slid it back onto the shelf himself. I didn't ask. She choked on air before she could finish, because he immediately grabbed her shoulders and turned her around to face him, literally slamming her back into the shelving unit. We need to talk. I have nothing to say to you. Julian raised her voice, and then, remembering where she was, switched to a whisper. I don't want to talk to you. Is that so? After all you've done. He lowered his tone too, as if to tease me. By the way, you've caused me so much damage. You call everyone up to the director. Losses. Who would even think of trading test answers? Businessman, hummed Alfred. You're a dishonest man. You're a liar. You're a... You tell me you're not a gentleman. His hand suddenly moved from the girl's rounded shoulder to her thin, tall neck. Her fingers ran along the edge of the white starched collar of her uniform dress, as if groping, outlining the contour of her collarbones. What is it about you, huh? You dress like a grandmother and act like one. What are you doing? The girl whispered. Her voice was quiet, barely audible, no longer out of habit of following the library rules, but because of the strange numbness spreading through her body from where Alfred touched. Yes, so, he grinned, but with just his lips his eyes were cold. There was nothing to do. He pulled away, took a step to the side, and so some distance finally appeared between them. The obsession was over. Nothing to do. Julian gasped for air. Alfred stood with his hands in the pockets of his jeans, on top of a t-shirt with some soccer club symbols and a black jacket, obviously a size or two larger than necessary. Despite his tall height of almost 190 centimeters, the guy was not very broad in the shoulders and was terribly complex about it, but kept it, of course, in secret. Alfred was the storm of the school, elusive, and at the same time a well-known bully for the whole neighborhood. Well, for his half of it, exactly. And he was also a repeater with a long history of delay in the third, sixth, and eighth grades. It was hard to understand what was the terrible truth about him and what was a terrible rumor, but in any case it would be hard to find a person more opposite in terms of qualities and features noticeable at first sight, compared to Juliana. She, like him, turned 18 this spring, at the very beginning of the season, when the first drop appeared from the roofs. But if Alfred looked 20, Juliana, much younger than her age, the principal, the principal, the canteen girl and some other people admired it, loved to compare how different the schoolgirl looked from her peers, that was different and in general lived right, took care of Juliana Leslie's grandmother, who for 10 years has also been her guardian after the death of her parents, who died in a car accident and the only one of her kindred person in the world. Two people who belonged to very different eras lived in a three-room apartment Stalinka. In her working past, Leslie taught history and literature, almost 30 years lived in the far north. Her pension was decent, she had enough to live on. However, an outside observer might decide that the life of grandmother and her granddaughter was peculiar. Juliana received an exceptionally strict domestic upbringing. Grandmother had no doubt that the modern world could not be trusted with a child. Grind young, stupid creature, destroy the soul, morality, cripple the future. Leslie herself kept herself apart, socialized only with a few, worthy in her opinion people about her age, and if there was anyone who had the audacity to say that she was treating the child somehow wrong, that person received such an angry, logically structured and reasoned response that he himself was guilty of everything, and in general, shame, shame on his head. And in time, the neighbors got used to it. After all, every family has its own rules, everyone knows that. And since Leslie's pupil was cleanly dressed and frozen in winter, was always well-fed, well-behaved, since Leslie herself had an impeccable reputation for the last 50 years. Then in time everyone calmed down, and even began to envy a little, 
After all, Leslie brought up her granddaughter so that just a gold, not a girl, not at all like modern children, the joy of the family, just a little good-natured lady, not a girl. Until the fifth grade, Juliana was homeschooled and then still went to school. And she was the black sheep. Her teachers praised her for her diligence and intelligence. They gave her A's. Once only got a C for an essay on how I spent my summer. In it, a sixth grader described how she had spent the whole summer reading works on world economy and the history of capitalism. The teacher said that it was very informative, but I would like to know about her personal, so to speak, life, impressions, adventures. Was it really just books all summer? Juliana answered boldly that her grandmother had a friend, Alexander Schwartz, who was 90 years old on his birthday and had written books on the history of capitalism. That's why it was necessary to read them all. And then, according to the results, so to speak, write a poem and read it to the Jubilee. Everything else is selfishness and vanity against the background of such an important matter. If Juliana had said this one-on-one, -on -one, the teacher might not have gotten angry, but the confrontation happened in front of the whole class. The class fell down from laughter and the teacher gave her a C. Because of this C, the girl became ill. Such a hysteria happened, which ended with fainting, that an ambulance had to be called. Naturally, the teacher replaced the C with a B, for goodness sake. But Juliana still long walked in sadness and told everyone that she was a talentless and a failure, since her essay was evaluated only on some pathetic three. However, Juliana stood out not only the specifics of this study. She dressed very original. The closet of the pupil, of course, was occupied by her grandmother and consisted of things good, new, but only sewed on the fashion of the 30s of the last century. And that they were not the most fashionable, dressy styles of that era. The shoes were also the most modest, flat shoes, not stained. Her classmates were growing up, becoming teenagers, young girls. They were learning to use makeup, getting manicures, coloring their hair. Julian couldn't afford any of that. Not that she didn't want to. Sometimes she thought her grandmother was too strict. But then she remembered that Leslie had a weak heart and that in the modern world, life was not so easy because of such loose morals, and any rudiments of rebellious sentiments withered like wheat without water in the hot summer. However, Juliana was not one of those bad girls who can be transformed only by a beauty salon. By adulthood, the girl's figure had become feminine, soft, and lush, in the right places, outlines. She had a slightly elongated face with high cheekbones, a straight nose, and a wide, sensual mouth. Gray eyes were framed by black, fluffy lashes. Her long brown hair was never seen in anything but one of three hairstyles. Two braids on each side, one braid in the back, or one braid arranged in a wreath around her head. Add to this refined manners, shyness, modesty, and the habit of keeping in the shadow of everything bright, noisy, provocative, modern, and also the fact that almost all her interests and daily activities were filtered through her grandmother's opinion on whether it was worthy, whether it was decent. If some meticulous outsider were to analyze Juliana like a strange exotic animal, he would easily find the reasons why people around her perceived her as a strange person. And that was putting it mildly, and only in exceptional cases, such as in clashes with Alfred, who for the last two years had increasingly made her the object of his attacks, light but offensively barbed. Only in rare cases, Julian's usual calmness would come off and she would begin. Not that she would be rude, never, but to answer sharply and defend herself vigorously. So you have nothing to do, Julian repeated. Well, go and study, you lady, or help out. Someone broke a window in class three. It's blowing. There are kids there. You need to. Wow, you're quick. Alfred smiled as usual. No, you're acting like a grandmother and thinking the same way. You know what? I've sorted out my problems. I won't be expelled. Thanks to Maria Ivanovna, our class teacher. She covered for me. She, you know, understands. If you give her a hand. What? Yes, Maria. She has four children. She's a kind-hearted, fair-minded person. You don't believe me? You want to bet? She's gonna give John an A on the test because his daddy brought her candy and stuff. John was an incorrigible loser and no one in the class doubted that he would fail the math final. Julian had heard of bets, 
or rather she had read about them in some books no old people made them and usually it didn't end well there was no way she was going to take some stupid bet but today was not the right day at all first the grandmother thought her granddaughter had splashed herself in the morning the girl swore she never went near her grandmother's dressing table but she made her go to the bathroom to clean herself up anyway then it turned out that the grandmother just thought that in the closet there was a moth, so she put perfume and sprayed there. That's why Julianne's clothes smelled. The grandmother didn't apologize, and Juliana felt unjustly offended. Then before school, she ran to the store to get tights. It was not a boutique, but a very modest store of youth clothes, and it was here that she and her grandmother sometimes came when they needed to buy Juliana something that Leslie could not sue. Usually it was something from outerwear. This time, one of the sales girls did not just watch from a distance as usual, but approached Juliana. The girl thought that she probably did that because she didn't have her grandmother with her now, or she wouldn't have dared to approach. Her grandmother couldn't stand all those consultants and knew how to chase them away. The saleswoman started talking about new youth clothes, very stylish denim skirts and beautiful sweaters. Julian glanced at this and turned away. No even if she herself had been wearing what her grandmother sued for two years now. There was no way she was going to upset her and dress differently. I feel sorry for the girl, sighed behind her back, sharing with a colleague. What a wild thing to say. How will she, poor thing, live when grandma is gone, will be lost with such an attitude? She's not adapted to life at all. No, she'll be left without an apartment or lured into a cult. And where did the neighbors and teachers look, eh? It was hard, painful to hear that. And at the same time, Juliana couldn't help but admit that this woman, Caroline, saw the name on the counselor's name day. She was right about something. Juliana was really scared to think about the time when she would be alone. Grandma had been talking a lot lately about her grandfather taking her to heaven soon. And she, Juliana, if she misbehaved, she would end her days on the pavement. So, to prevent that from happening, she would have to study hard, protect herself, and be a man of honor. What's the bet? Julian blurted out before she could even think about what she was doing. That's a different conversation. Halford's voice had a purr in it. If you're right and John fails, I'll, I'll pay back the money I won from Toby. Julian nodded that would be very good. That would be great, because Toby was a third grader from a large family, and he'd lost everything he'd saved from his pocket money for six months. And I'll also sign up for these, what's their name? Volunteers. And I'm gonna go to the city park and plant trees. And I'm not gonna swear. Okay. Yes, I agree. Wait, he suddenly grabbed her wrist. You didn't even ask what you know if you lost. What do you want? She opened her eyes. Her wrist burned. It wasn't the pain of the grip that was barely perceptible. It was some other strange perception of his closeness. You agreed to the bet, right? But I did. You know, I don't follow you much, it's too much. But I remember you were talking in literature class about keeping your word, something about honor, was there. It was. The girl exhaled and tensed, preparing to wrench her arm free. Which means you'll keep your word. And if you lose, you come where I tell you to come, and spend the night with me. Why? Julian squeaked. Theoretically, the guy was very clear. Only in the brain as an automatic system went off from the logical deciphering of this phrase, to spend the night. Why should we come to your place for the night? Well, don't play dumb. You understand everything, he said simply. And then he let her go, winked, and disappeared as if he vanished among the shells. Julian stood there, barely breathing, staring blankly at herself. Oh no, what was going to happen to her now? How could she? How dare he? The girl swallowed hard. Had Alfred not had enough of the atrocities he was doing, why would he do this to her? Why? There you are, the librarian appeared in the aisle. After she had instructed the polite girl to arrange the books, she took time out to have some tea. Oh, why are you so pale? Did you put all the books away? What's new on your list? Yes, that's it, Julian replied, her thoughts wandering far away from the library. Thank you. There's nothing. And she left. Much to the amazement of the old librarian, she didn't even say goodbye. And then the day of the test came. John was sitting next to Julianne, and she realized, peeking carefully, 
that he had no solutions to the problems, but a lot of nonsense. Finally, everyone handed in their notebooks. Julian cast a triumphant glance at Alfred, who was sitting on the cam caca. She had no doubt that everything would be as it should be. That justice would prevail, that he would lose, that he would be shamed, and that he would be forced to take the path of correction. He might have promised everything just to annoy her, but in the end it would all have a positive effect on him, of course. And then, it became known that John had gotten a five. Alfred found her, or rather caught her, just outside the school gates, just growing in front of her so that she crashed into him again. Hi. Hi, the girl replied and lowered her head. Well, 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 why are we so sad? Does it feel bad to lose? But it had to happen sometime. You can't live your whole life so right, so perfect. You're judging me? I tried to go around, but he wouldn't let me. Okay, let's not get into any of your ideas, okay? We had a bet. Now do you have to do what we agreed to do. You know, this is kind of fun. If there were anyone else, I'm sure the other girl would have sent the bet in me far away. But you're not like that, are you? You gave your word, so. Here you go. He held out some paper. My father had a summer house in the suburbs. There's no one there now. Come Saturday night. Hey, you're not going to cry, are you? Don't worry, I won't bite. We'll have a great time. I'll treat you to kebabs. The doctor said it looked like a heart attack was imminent and hospitalization was necessary. Julian fumbled around, gathering the things she would need at the hospital according to her grandmother's instructions. Leslie was taken away. Julian returned to the apartment, locked the front door, sank down on the banquet in the hallway and covered her face with her hands and sobbed. What a nightmare everything was turning out to be. Just a black streak. And at the same time, it was impossible not to recognize that this misfortune allows her to carry out her plans because her grandmother will be in the hospital for a few days. And therefore, the fact that her granddaughter did not spend the night at home will not become known to her. Frivolous books, erotic movies, such in the cultural and educational menu compiled by her grandmother for Juliana was not. Naturally, the young girl had some knowledge about the relationship between the sexes and the school program introduced to the fact that children are not found in cabbage, and yet, the girl understood that if she thought about what she was going to do a little more, she would simply lose her feelings. Theoretically, in this of course, there was a plus the date would be cancelled, but the downside was she would essentially be betraying her habit of being an honest person. Today you lied about finishing the cutlets and threw them away. Her grandmother had once reprimanded her, and for some reason that incident was particularly sharp in Juliana's memory. And tomorrow, her grandmother narrowed her eyebrows and slapped the missing cutlets in front of her. You'll go stealing, or run over a man with a car at a green light. Grandma, please forgive me, little Julian asked, choking back tears. You're not going to make me finish them, are you? They were. They were in the garbage pail. Leslie stroked the girl's head and then grabbed her ear pulling her away from the table. Take them out and give them to the stray cats that live in the basement. Stick your hands straight up and throw them down. Grandma. The girl even stopped crying out of fear. We don't have cats under the house, only rats. There are rats there. I don't want to. It's too late, sweetheart. The old woman grinned. You have to take responsibility for your actions. Go. And if the rats bite your fingers, she touched each of the five fingers on her granddaughter's left hand. It'll be your own fault. I, my dear, ready to love you in every way. Even if you are crooked on your face. Even if you study for DS. But if I find out that you're lying. If I find out that you don't keep your word. If you ever lie to me like this again. You'll drive me into a coffin with this. And you won't have a grandmother anymore. You'll go to an orphanage to live. Do you understand? After that, 10-year-old Juliana realized that she would always, always, all her life be an honest person, and she would not break her word to go and give herself into the hands of the monster in human form. Juliana chose her weekend dress, the most elegant dress, snow-white Richelieu fabric, sun skirt, and wing sleeves. Her hair was bound with a dark green ribbon. She decided not to think about what would happen until it happened. She decided to take it one step at a time gather herself and make sure all appliances were turned off. Leave the apartment and the house. At the bus stop, take a bus to the station where the commuter trains leave from. 
get off the light version of the train, and she was a little confused, but she was told the way was to walk across a field. It was not terrible, there were more people walking there, some cheerful company of Granny's gardeners, they were singing songs. A young, strong voice suddenly broke into their elderly chorus. The grandmothers marveled at the unusual companion, who, so young, knew the words of the old hymn, but immediately sang again and so, the whole company, reached the Dacha community. It was separated from a small village with a funny name of Jishiki, by a field where in the old days huge herds of cows grazed, and now rare livestock kept by the locals. A little farther south, the village and the Dacha estates were surrounded by a river that dried up to the bottom during the hot summer months. Julianne opened her mouth to say that she couldn't come anywhere, because how could she possibly explain her grandmother's absence at night? She didn't even have any friends she could, theoretically, stay overnight, but she didn't say anything. Alfred left the school with a double feeling. On the one hand, he had managed to achieve something that seemed unreal, but on the other hand, he felt as if he had soiled himself in something nasty, dirty. Juliana was different from the other girls, and for more than a year she had been only an object of interested, mocking observation. But then, he began to notice things that others didn't. How good she was, always a straight back proud, but not haughty, but a sort of, here, the right word for it is aristocratic head planting. This girl never gossiped about others, never brought cheat sheets, it was clear she didn't live an easy life, but no one heard her complain. It seemed that she existed in her own closed, like a soap bubble, world. At recess, she would duck into a book and go deaf. Then one day, she suddenly noticed Alfred was in a bad mood and threw something like, don't take offense, she wouldn't understand. This phrase referred to the conversation Alfred had had with his geography teacher for about 10 minutes, who had reprimanded him harshly and with a switch to personalities for not having done his homework and didn't want to hear about the fact that there was no time for it because Alfred's apartment was being renovated and he couldn't refuse to help. She always scolded her students harshly for everything after her husband got his paycheck because, as rumor had it, the lion's share of that salary he took to his mistress, so she found someone to take her anger out on. It was Julian's statement that caught Alfred's eye. He didn't ask for pity and no one dared tell him what to think or feel. He tried to hurt Julian with taunts, but it was all in vain. He began to observe her more, and he didn't realize how it turned into an obsession. Yes, that word seemed quite right to him, and Alfred didn't want to do anything about it. Why should he? After all, she, in all likelihood, like many other people, already had a certain idea of him. So why disappoint her? And even if he had no chance of gaining her favor in kind, well, so be it, but he would get what he wanted. Julian was greeted by the familiar, adoring smells of her grandmother's late lunch of chicken noodle soup and blueberry puff pastries. But before she sat down at the table, at the very threshold, grandmother asked Juliana what grade her test had gotten at school. Only when she was satisfied with the answer did she tell her to take off her shoes and wash her hands. Then they sat down to watch TV and some old movie about the Musketeers was on. Then Grandma, though it was already 8 o'clock in the evening, took out the crystal from the cupboard, though she hadn't had time to wash it in the morning, so she had to wash it in the evening. She said, handing her pupil an apron, without which no housework could be done. Then Leslie went to bed. Julian was left to herself. The hands on the dial were approaching midnight, inexorably approaching the coming of Saturday. The girl convulsively sucked in air, leaned back on the bed, closed her eyes. What should she do? Break her word? She could, of course. It was unlikely that for such dishonorable behavior she would be immediately hit by karma, a boomerang. That is, a deserved retribution from fate, which her grandmother was so fond of talking about. And anyway, Julianne somehow couldn't imagine how she would exist after. Not to mention that this very thing, the very thing she had signed up for. Julianne sat up abruptly on the bed, then paced the room, then a damn it came from her lips. Julian was more and more inclined to tell her grandmother and let her scold, let her punish. But then she would have the opportunity to think of two minds how to be now. Grandmother would not leave her, would comfort her and say that, of course, there could be only a negative answer. Granddaughter came the voice of an old woman in the hallway. The girl shuddered. 
Why isn't Granny asleep? She can't read minds, I think. Granddaughter, Leslie repeated in a hoarse, weak voice. I have a heart attack. Call an ambulance. Who are you here to see, honey? One of the old ladies asked. Just here, Julian frowned. Some acquaintances asked me to drop something off. She waved her hand in the direction. Toward the woods, not the houses. Well, good luck to you, replied the old woman, realizing that the girl did not want to talk about herself. All right. Alfred's cottage was really near the forest and stood at the very edge of the community and it looked abandoned. Julian shuddered at his choice of a place for a date. She knew he didn't live alone and was being raised by a distant relative after Alfred's father had been imprisoned for theft a few years ago. Julian also knew that the boy's father had passed away last year. She had sympathized with him then and even tried to get close to him, to comfort him. Maybe he had misunderstood her attention then, had made up something for himself. By evening it was noticeably colder, and the girl chose her clothes according to the weather, which was still sunny and warm. But now it didn't seem to matter at all that her body was shivering, what was frightening was something else. Finally, Julian found herself on the porch and knocked on the door. Hi, he said and a look of amazement flashed across his face as if he was sure she wasn't coming. Hi, she said, thinking that awkward mutual greetings like this were becoming a habit. Julian didn't want to make any habits with this guy. Come on in, he stepped aside, letting me into the house. The girl froze, hesitated, as if something nightmarish was waiting for her beyond the threshold. However, in fact, it was so. Inside the house turned out to be as she had expected it to be, in need of repair and general cleaning. The furniture had been brought in on a what-not-to-spare basis, and the floors were painted a luscious orange. Julian remembered that the same floors had been in her grandmother's house in the country. She had been there only a few times and then she had sold it because she didn't have the energy to travel to keep everything in order, and it was too far away to use it as a summer house. But the main reason for getting rid of the family nest was that she needed money for her, Juliana, nurturing. This word nurturing, grandmother used, by the way, when she wanted to reproach her granddaughter. They say, I spend so much effort raising you and you still manage to catch a cold in winter, tear a new dress on a walk, refuse to drink fish oil for immunity, do not put away toys, lisp. The list of reasons for reproach was endless. And only when Juliana grew up, or rather when she was 15, she began to think that she was not to blame for everything and everything. Just sometimes, grandma needed a fight, and the person to do it with that will was just her kindergartner. So, do you want a drink? Alfred threw awkwardly, escorting the girl deep into the house. I don't drink, she said, glancing at him warily. I know, I already know. I'm asking about the tea. No. Coffee? No, I'm, I'm not after that. And you, we can. She clenched her hands so white her knuckles turned white. I know I lost the bet, and I'll keep my word. I'm ready, but can't you hurry up? She threw the last words at him angrily, resolutely crossing the distance between them. She stood close again, and he could almost feel her breath. Now Alfred looked dumbfounded. I know I have a reputation, but why are you attacking me like? Courtesans used to be called courtesans, didn't they? Yes, there, you see. Turns out we can speak the same language, he smirked. Okay, that was an unfortunate comparison, I'm sorry. But do you think I'm going to attack you like a barbarian? Julian said nothing. Alfred sighed, sniffled oddly, and stepped back, shoving his hands into the pockets of his jeans. It was quite dusky in this part of the cottage. Light poured in from the ajar door on the right, and there were two in this cluttered hallway or cluttered living room, or rather, a cluttered living room, because there couldn't possibly be a living room at the cottage. Julian was more inclined toward the latter, given the fireplace she'd noticed, which must have been unheated for a hundred years, so dusty and littered with debris. But she was much more interested in Alfred than in the surroundings. On the way here, her brain had been drawing the most fantastic, disgusting pictures. She imagined being at the mercy of a cynical, immoral scumbag. But why did it seem that now she was just a boy who wanted to seem tough, tough, like the bad guys in action movies, but was desperately afraid of it? So, you're shivering and you'll sneeze tomorrow, apparently, 
the prolonged silence in which they were frozen, like two exhibits in an abandoned museum, began to irritate him. Come on, I'll put the tea on. Julianne doomedly stomped after her. What's all this for? What? Drinking me tea. It makes sense because you're cold. What does it matter if you if you're going to? What are you doing? Squealed the girl as Alfred pulled the sweater over his head. The guy froze and rounded his eyes. She took a step back. Another. She put her back against the wall and put her purse in front of her in a desperate protective gesture. No, please. I'm not ready. A moment later, a scratchy woolen article of clothing flew into her face. Stupid. Here, it's cold to look at. Alfred, who was left in a t-shirt, turned his back to her and began to work on the gas stove. Put it on. I'm not peeking. The desire for warmth outweighed the embarrassment of using something that was not hers, much less a man's, and Julian tangled in the sleeves and pulled on the sweater. Thank you, she said quietly, so he wouldn't have heard. You know, I'm really surprised you came. It's just doing something on a word of honor. It's kind of old-fashioned these days. Can't do otherwise, she shrugged, sitting down at the table. What if I bet you something worse? Like stealing something? That would never happen. Julian declares smugly. So, what happened is within the bounds of your morality. A teapot and a couple of cups were placed on the table. All three items had clearly once belonged to an obvious set. That's not what I meant to say, the girl muttered. You cheated, caught me giving my word before I knew what the condition was. When he filled the cup, she wrapped her palms around it, her body desperate for some warmth, though it was terribly hot. All right, I give up. I am a scoundrel a scoundrel and a seducer. But the end justified the means. Smiling, he sat down beside me. Is there nothing for tea? She asked timidly, suddenly realizing that her stomach was protesting against the empty drink. Julian had somehow missed lunch and dinner as she pondered nervously. I had chips and a candy bar, but I ate them while I was waiting for you. Oh no, I'm lying. Here's half a chocolate bar, he added it to the table. I see. For a while there was silence in the kitchen, where a lone light bulb shone, apart from the sounds of tea drinking. What was that? Julianne was suddenly alert. I didn't hear anything. Alfred said nonchalantly. I heard something. You're imagining things. Is there anyone else in the house? The girl went cold. No. You're lying. I'm not lying. There's no one here. The guy nodded at the doorway. Well, except for him. A puppy came into the room. He was a well-fed Colobus, a mix of Sheepdog and Street Bernard, and he wiggled his nose and paw funny. The first was out of lively young curiosity, the second because it was wrapped in a bandage. Oh, he's so cute. Julian jumped down from her chair and was next to the puppy in no time. Grandma's strict upbringing included, among other rules, one that read, No animals in my house. Don't go near dogs in the street. They will chew you up and give you fleas. The puppy recoiled, but then attracted by the fact that the stranger was wearing a sweater that smelled of his master, he moved forward. Where did he come from? He followed me to the station on the way here. He must have hurt his paw on the street. I patched it up a little. Are you gonna keep it? I have a right to. Halford grinned unhappily. As long as he lives at the dacha, and of course, when I leave here on weekdays, he'll stay with the neighbors. I've already arranged it and then I'll take it. I've decided to rent an apartment for myself. I'm looking for options. I can't bring him to the place where I live now. They'll throw him out on the street. Alfred whistled, calling the dog. But the girl didn't let the doggy take a step and picked him up in her arms, returned to the table, pulled out a chair, sat down and settled the puppy on her lap. The dog, she stated a fact already known to the boy. He's so cute. He reached out to stroke it too, and their fingers met in the thick, silky fur. And the fur must have electrified, because a strange, lingering sensation hit them both. Julian froze, wide-eyed as she watched the boy's face grow closer. How beautiful you are, he whispered. That's it, you're finished. The convict grinned and pulled something from his belt that glinted like steel in the cold light of the moon. They were separated by a mere three or four meters. He was not a coward but he was not a fool to stay heroically in the house and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Tyaf, Tyaf, a puppy threw itself at his master's feet. He wasn't a coward either, but he was too young, and when the house had been broken into, 
He'd just been scared and huddled under the couch, crying in his own puppy way. And now that two good people he knew were there, he'd risk getting out. Julian took an extra couple of seconds to bend down and pick up the baby. How did you? Alfred's eyes widened as they stepped over, or rather jumped over, the convict lying on the floor. He had not expected such a thing from his unwilling guest, but all questions could wait. Without collusion and without wasting any more breath on superfluous words, the young people with the puppy under their armpits flew out of the house and rushed across the plot to the neighbor's cottage. They didn't even turn around to see if they were being followed. They ran up on the porch and banged on the door. Help! Call the police! Help me! The further events merged into several long hours, later recalled as if through a fall. Alarmed neighbors came to help and soon those who had broken into Alfred's father's cottage in the middle of the night were caught. They were indeed, as Juliana thought at once, escaped prisoners. An ambulance also arrived and the doctor who examined Alfred said that in principle it was nothing serious. His jaw was not broken and that was the main thing. Young lady, don't take any more risks like that, the doctor said to Juliana. Alone on such a big man with a frying pan. Dashing, but... And if you had missed, I can't imagine. And what else could I do? Now that everything was over, Juliana could not stop shivering, although she was drinking a second mug of scalding hot tea. And two woolen plates, given by kind-hearted dacha neighbors, were thrown over her shoulders. Alfred, disobeying Julianne, looked out into the street just as the very convict who had attacked him was being led to the police car. I wish I had time to fight back. Alfred spat on the ground and shook his fist at the man. He cursed and scrambled to his feet, trying to throw himself back into the fight. But of course, no one would let him. Alfred heard a few more things about himself and his father. It's all clear, he muttered, walking back into the house and sitting down at the table, leaning over his cup sluttishly. And then he explained to Juliana who it was. It turned out that two prisoners had escaped from the very colony where Alfred's father was and they hadn't chosen his cottage by chance. He had been a lifelong liar, Alfred said. He was both eager to speak and uncomfortable with his own need for candor. Julian also noticed for the umpteenth time that Alfred called his father he. But in principle, such an oddity was already familiar since the boy's parent had gone to the colony four years ago. Alfred almost never said, Father, or Lawrence. He lie here, too. I thought it would add to this influence in the zone. The young man grinned bitterly. He was still at home when he was still lying about the gold buried in the dacha, which he had stolen back in the 90s. You can imagine, usually Alfred spoke about his father without emotion. But now, apparently, against the background of the experience, his intonation oozed indignation. He lied to me that there was gold in the garden, and I was just a little kid back then. So I took a shovel and dug joyfully from fence to fence. Where did I get my strength from? He was laughing. You mean there's no gold? Julian asked. No, of course not. Everyone here was using metal detectors about 10 years ago. The summer house was rented out to some students. They listened to that nonsense and started to turn everything upside down looking for it. And there was never any gold. That's it. It's so simple. He couldn't accept the fact that he was no longer the big bandit everyone was afraid of. That he had once lost at cards. Mom left us back then. That's probably why he lost his mind. So he created the illusion that he had money, but it wasn't time to take it yet. What a bastard. Alfred raised his voice. Even before he died, he had time to make a mess. How do I know that no one else will come here, in El Dorado, in the middle of nowhere? I had enough. I'm leaving. It was none of her business. And if she had had the opportunity to leave and never see Alfred again in her life, but a little earlier, before the attack, she would have gladly taken it and would even have given a lot for such a gift of faith. But now, she couldn't explain it to herself and she didn't want to get into the intricacies of her feelings, but she just suddenly realized that she cared about Alfred. It was discouraging, frightening, made her feel like a bad, spoiled girl. But Julian couldn't change that, even if she wanted to. Will you pass your exams? Alfred extended his hand and snapped his fingers in front of her nose. Wake up. What exams? What will this school give me? What about going to college? She whispered. The woolen blanket slipped off her shoulders, but the girl didn't even notice the chill. 
Yeah, the Institute. People like me, missing. Nothing in life is meant to be. Alfred averted his eyes. No, no, you're not lost. You don't have to be. There's no such thing as being like your father or that you have to live your whole life unhappy. You can be different, whatever you want. Julian's voice sounded firm and determined now, as if she were speaking to a large audience, like her class, and had something very important to tell them. What do you know about me? Alfred said it in his usual mocking and superior tone, but there was a different kind of loneliness and lostness in his eyes. Like he was suddenly alone in the world. Julian knew, in fact, that he was. She could have sworn this guy didn't have any really close friends, the kind you trusted like yourself, the kind who wouldn't let you go to waste, and then the thought struck like lightning, but does she have any? A grandmother is something else. A family person, she replaced mom and dad, but still, it's different. And she doesn't have any friends, Julianne herself. You're right, she replied. I know the rumors and what you yourself have said. And that's not much. And you don't need more than that. Alfred rose abruptly from the table. Let me call you a cab home. No way. Steve, the neighbor and owner of the cottage, intervened in the conversation. He hadn't overheard the conversation. He just had his own business with the late Sprouts in the next room and overheard a lot of things. Steve had known Alfred for three years, that is, exactly since he had bought a plot here. At first, he had thought Alfred was a troublemaker and a criminal. That's how the distant relative of the young man, who became his guardian, had described it. But then Steve changed his opinion. If only because no one in the cottage community and in the nearby village could not recall any bad deeds in which Alfred was involved. If only because this kid was seen in good deeds here, he helped to fix the barn for livestock one grandmother in the village. He helped to find a lost cat and some townspeople who came to the cottage for summer vacation. He participated in clearing the pond of all sorts of garbage, and even once restrained the local gang of hooligans when they got to molest the girl's daughters of the owners of the lost cat. All in all, Alfred was, in Steve's opinion, a great guy. He didn't really understand what he had in common with Juliana and decided that it was probably his girlfriend, a romantic interest, so to speak. Why don't you come and sleep at our place? There's plenty of room. I'll give you some bedding. We'll set up two places right away, youngsters. We'll have tea in the morning. Steve waved his hand. And then I'll give you both a lift to the station. All right? Julianne and Alfred nodded in agreement. So they all did. Grushenka, at last you're back. A neighbor who looked out of the apartment across the hall rushed to the girl. Good afternoon, Salima. The girl smiled politely. I slept over at an acquaintance's place. She had already prepared a lie about the fact that this acquaintance had a small child and she needed to work the night shift and her husband too. And so until they adjust the schedules as necessary, they are looking for friends who will sit with the baby. But from the next words of the neighbor, Juliana almost fainted. I got a call. I know your grandmother well, Selena said quickly. They called from the hospital. They couldn't reach you. Oh, what a grief and she was in good health. What? What's wrong with grandma? Julian leaned against the cold entryway wall. I was called, so the neighbor was in no hurry to get to the point. Anyway, during the night, Leslie got worse. The doctors were frantic. Oh, what a grief. You're all alone, the neighbor longed. Grandmother. Grandmother. Is she dead? Julian's hand rose and lay on her neck. How hard it is to breathe. It felt like the sky was going to fall on my head. Was it really like this? Like this? Ridiculous everything. She was far away from her grandmother in her last hour. No, why would you think that? Ah, uh, spit. The neighbor waved her hands. Don't you listen to me at all? What am I telling you, stupid? I'm telling you that you are alone. Since grandma went to the hospital, it must be hard for you, alone. Anyway. By morning, she was feeling better, and they called me again to say that they had never seen a patient recover so soon. They say that in such a manner, in a week she'll be home. Oh, Krushenka, why have you turned so pale? You look as if you were undead. Selena, the girl shook her head and turned away, jingling her keys to open her apartment door. You can't talk at all. That's why they don't like you in the whole building. And she went in and slammed the door, extremely impolite without even saying goodbye to her neighbor. Selena stood with her mouth hanging open. 
Julian had never let herself do anything like this before. However, said the neighbor, and then, remembering that she had put the chicken on the boil for soup and left the fire on high, she yelped and ran back to her room. Her grandmother was indeed soon discharged home and life in Juliana's small family quickly returned to normal. But then it became clear that something was changing. Juliana often thought about Alfred. They hadn't seen each other since they parted at the station. The boy said he would go on the next train. But for now, he wanted to walk a little more and think about everything. Sometimes walking down the street, Julian caught herself looking for him with her eyes. Why? She couldn't explain it to herself clearly. But she remembered what he had said at the station before the train started. He had said he was very sorry for her and apologized for the idiotic bet. I thought I'd feel better if I got you. It's only made it worse. He didn't explain anything else. He just disappeared. Julian thought once about finding him herself. Just go to this house, maybe he hadn't had time to move out of this family's apartment yet. But each time she restrained herself from such pointless foolishness. Then, as the train pulled away from Juliana, Alfred looked at her, and then, pulling the puppy gently by the leash, went for a walk. He really had a lot to think about. Time after time, he replayed the events of the previous evening. But until the moment when the strangers had broken into the house, when Juliana had yet to arrive, Alfred had been in a state of confusion. In his mind, he knew that he could triumph and get literally anything he wanted from her. But only, his own recent impudence somehow began to seem an unworthy, dirty deed. And imagining what would happen when the girl crossed the threshold of the dacha, Alfred somehow could not. Could not in his fantasies to do anything indecent. The most he could imagine was a kiss. And this hesitancy, this stupid modesty only irritated him more. Then he belatedly still thought about the fact that as promised then in the library can tomorrow, theoretically, treat kebabs, pork and corollinade is in the fridge, but nothing now for evening tea. Delicious. There is no such thing. It turned out quite nonsense. He invited the girl of his dreams, but he could not accept her. The dog pulled the leash sharply, thus pulling Alfred out of his thoughts. Up no, said the boy. There are geese grazing there. Let's not go hunting them. Let's go in the grass over there. You little dog. It'll be like a jungle for you. Let's play. But even while having fun with his pet, Alfred couldn't stop the flow of thoughts. Only now they took a different direction. He remembered suddenly how many times his father had grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and said that they were of the same breed and that Alfred was destined to be a thief, a bandit, and that at six, at eight, at ten, he hated his father like that. He fought him off, shouted that he would never do such abominations as he did. Because of this, his father was furious and threatened that he would teach his son wisdom. And then growing up, Alfred began to realize that many people were not ready to listen to him about who he was in himself. It turned out that many people perceived him as the son of that thief Lawrence from so-and-so's house. Alfred faced the fact that children were forbidden to play with him. He was looked down upon in the local stores as if he were 12 years old and only thinking about stealing something. Mistrust, contempt. Alfred responded to all this at first with muffled resentment and then came other feelings. Alfred became hostile to the world. He didn't want to be like his father, but he also realized that he was too often seen as a creature in Lawrence's shadow. That's an extension of him. Alfred grew up a disobedient child. He realized early on that it was not necessary to ask about his mother. He had enough of one frank conversation with his father, who said that she left him for a new family, in which the husband is all so right, and even rich, in which other, normal children have already been born. Alfred, it was enough to realize that it turns out that the mother as if there is no, as if he is an orphan half with the living parent. And then it happened so that Alfred found understanding in the company of guys who were considered the main bullies in the neighborhood. They somehow got together. He was attracted by the fact that these guys do not suspect him of any evil, do not persecute. Yes, they were not the ideal of virtue, real hooligans, but society with them beckoned so that he had no strength to resist. Alfred, however, kept a little to himself, and in many of their scandalous antics did not participate. He was 16 when the leader of the gang said that they didn't need a man who wasn't ready to be on the same page with them. Alfred got sidetracked, except the rumors about what a scumbag he was didn't go away. 
They grew like weeds. And now he could not and did not want to fight them. In fact, he decided that it was probably even better. They would be more afraid, so they would be less offended. And for a while it seemed that it was normal to exist like that. But now Alfred wasn't so sure. He was sick to think that he had no other way but to follow the stereotypes that surrounded him. It was impossibly strange, but it was since he'd begun to get closer to Julianne that he'd been having those thoughts more often. And after the events of that night, Alfred suddenly realized clearly that he could really make his life anything he wanted it to be. He just had to make up his mind and change everything quickly, finally. Despite the fact that the final exams were approaching and free time was reduced to zero, Julian found an opportunity to work part-time on Sundays. It was a simple job handing out flyers to passersby on the street and paid very little, but it was the very first money earned in the life of a young girl. After calculating the income for two weekends, Julian made a difficult decision. How scary it was! But it was too late to retreat. It seemed to her that forward to the fulfillment of her plans, she was drawn by some unknown force, which is simply impossible to resist. First, Juliana went to the confectionery and chose a cake very small, half a kilo. But as assured her saleswoman at home delicious, it was honey cake with a layer of black currants. And then she walked into the mall, into a familiar clothing store. Julian's heart raced as she stopped at the racks, above which plastic letters that folded into the word de estil oyentes, hung invitingly. Can I get you anything? Julian shuddered as the young woman approached her. It was the same slightly familiar Caroline. For the first time in her life, Julian felt so keenly that she looked wonderful in the old-fashioned chintz dress below the knee, and she felt like a scarecrow. I'd like to try this on, she said and pulled the shoulders of the dress. It was a smoky gray knee-high dress made of knitted fabric with a couple of pockets in the front. Juliana chose it because it cost 499 rubles, and she had exactly 500 left after buying the cake. The consultant looked at the dress that the unusual client was wearing, then at the dress on the shoulder pads. I'm sorry, but may I offer some advice? She smiled shyly. These are leftovers from the last collection. And here, stepping back a step, she pointed to four mannequins showing brightly colored sundresses made of cotton with floral prints. A new collection, but we just haven't had time to put these particular models on sale yet. If you want, I will now bring your size, the consultant gabbled amiably. One moment, please. Before Julianne could say that she shouldn't worry, the consultant disappeared and then reappeared carrying four sundresses of different colors and in two sizes each. And right now, Juliana just didn't have the strength to refuse. Once these marvelous outfits were in her hands, it was as if a witch's spell had fallen on her. In the end, she came out of the fitting room clutching a sundress with large fuchsia flowers to her chest, looked down upon in the local stores as if he were 12 years old and only thinking about stealing something. Mistrust, contempt. Alfred responded to all this at first with muffled resentment, and then came other feelings. Alfred became hostile to the world. He didn't want to be like his father. But he also realized that he was too often seen as a creature in Lawrence's shadow, as an extension of him. Alfred grew up a disobedient child. He realized early on that it was not necessary to ask about his mother. He had enough of one frank conversation with his father, who said that she left him for a new family in which the husband is also right and even rich, in which other normal children have already been born. Alfred, it was enough to realize that it turns out that the mother as if there is no, as if he is an orphan half with a living parent. And then it happened so that Alfred found understanding in the company of guys who were considered the main bullies in the neighborhood. They somehow got together. He was attracted by the fact that these guys do not suspect him of any evil, do not persecute. Yes, they were not the ideal of virtue, real hooligans, but society with them beckoned so that he had no strength to resist. Alfred, however, kept a little to himself, and in many of their scandalous antics did not participate. He was 16 when the leader of the gang said that they didn't need a man who wasn't ready to be on the same page with them. Alfred got sidetracked, except the rumors about what a scumbag he was didn't go away. They grew like weeds, and now he could not and did not want to fight them. In fact, he decided that it was probably even better. They would be more afraid, so they would be less offended. And for a while it seemed that it was normal to exist like that. 
But now Alfred wasn't so sure. He was sick to think that he had no other way but to follow the stereotypes that surrounded him. It was impossibly strange, but it was since he'd begun to get closer to Julianne that he'd been having those thoughts more often. And after the events of that night, Alfred suddenly realized clearly that he could really make his life anything he wanted it to be. He just had to make up his mind and change everything quickly, finally. Despite the fact that the final exams were approaching and free time was reduced to zero, Julian found an opportunity to work part-time on Sundays. It was a simple job handing out flyers to passers-by on the street and paid very little, but it was the very first money earned in the life of a young girl. After calculating the income for two weekends, Julian made a difficult decision. How scary it was! But it was too late to retreat. It seemed to her that forward to the fulfillment of her plans, she was drawn by some unknown force, which is simply impossible to resist. First, Juliana went to the confectionery and chose a cake very small, half a kilo. But as assured her saleswoman at home delicious, it was honey cake with a layer of black currants. And then she walked into the mall, into a familiar clothing store. Julian's heart raced as she stopped at the racks, above which plastic letters that folded into the word D'Esilientes hung invitingly. Can I get you anything? Julian shuddered as the young woman approached her. It was the same slightly familiar Caroline. For the first time in her life, Julian felt so keenly that she looked wonderful in the old-fashioned chintz dress below the knee, and she felt like a scarecrow. I'd like to try this on, she said and pulled the shoulders of the dress. It was a smoky gray knee-high dress made of knitted fabric with a couple of pockets in the front. Juliana chose it because it cost 499 rubles, and she had exactly 500 left after buying the cake. The consultant looked at the dress that the unusual client was wearing, then at the dress on the shoulder pads. I'm sorry, but may I offer some advice? She smiled shyly. These are leftovers from the last collection, and here, stepping back a step, she pointed to four mannequins showing brightly colored sundresses made of cotton with floral prints. A new collection, but we just haven't had time to put these particular models on sale yet. If you want, I will now bring your size. The consultant gabbled amiably. One moment, please. Before Julian could say that she shouldn't worry, the consultant disappeared and then reappeared, carrying four sundresses of different colors and in two sizes each. And right now, Juliana just didn't have the strength to refuse. Once these marvelous outfits were in her hands, it was as if a witch's spell had fallen on her. In the end, she came out of the fitting room clutching a sundress with large fuchsia flowers to her chest. It's a great choice. It suits you very well, continued Caroline, who immediately escorted the happy-looking customer to the checkout in there, having sent her partner to the back of the hall to fix her clothes, which had been tumbled around all day. She herself began to calculate the price. Thank you for helping me choose, Julian smiled. Her cheeks burned with a feverish blush. Thank you, Caroline. Always happy to help update the image, smiled the one in return. Julian didn't know that Caroline had already looked at her before approaching her and realized from the fact that she had counted the bills several times that the budget for the outfit was very small. Juliana didn't know that the sundress she had chosen actually cost 2500 with all the discounts. So you owe exactly 500 the counselor said with a nonchalant look. Julian was already holding out the money, but her eyes fell on the cash register display, where the real price was displayed, and Caroline had hoped the girl wouldn't notice it. But Julian stammered and looked incomprehensible. That's the old price, the system malfunctioned. Caroline quickly found it. That'll be 500 rubles. And seeing that the girl was procrastinating, Caroline herself took the bill from her hands and also slid a rustling bag of clothes toward her across the counter. Take it, please. And thank you for buying. They exchanged glances. And it was so quick, so piercing, so clear. Julian clutched the package to her as if she couldn't believe in its tangible, tangible reality. Thank you. And she walked out of the store. Before the girl who was acting as a cashier in the store that day, returned to her seat. Caroline had managed to take out of her pocket a purse that she simply did not risk to leave in the changing room of the shopping center for the staff, and put into the cash register the missing 2000 for the sole sundress. If in those moments there was someone who would have asked her about the reason for such an act, she would not have been able to clearly answer what moved her, 
but certainly not ordinary pity. It was just, she decided that it was the right thing to do. It was not the first time Caroline had seen Julian in this store or in the city. They lived on the same street and even their houses were close window to window. Caroline was not a gossip, but if you did not live a reclusive life, you would learn about many of your neighbors and especially about those about whom people said that they were strange. This is how Caroline came to know Grandma Leslie and her child from afar through hearsay. Caroline herself had been raised in a single-parent family by her grandparents. True, not because of orphanhood, just parents were constantly on business trips, then in tourist trips, in general, lived their own, some separate from the native child, a rich life. But Caroline's grandparents were quite modern people, and so for her Juliana's upbringing seemed wild, but there was nothing to be done. Caroline had long been married for 10 years. It was quite a happy union and in principle, her husband's income would allow her to exist as a housewife. But when her son Victor went to the first grade, Caroline decided that enough of her reclusiveness and got a job in this shopping center, especially since she had always wanted the job to have something to do with clothes. Perhaps Caroline sometimes thought it was somehow passed on from her grandmother who had worked as a dressmaker for almost 40 years. It was here in the clothing store and Caroline had a chance to get to know Julian and her grandmother better. In the visits of an old woman and a teenage girl who then turned into a young and beautiful girl, the whole store, as they say, was painful to watch because Leslie, in her characteristic manner, was always reprimanding her granddaughter. Don't touch it, you'll tear it. No, you're not wearing that shit. No way. It's not for you. Put it back. Don't cry. I spend the money. I decide what you wear. These were the phrases that accompanied their trips to the store for a down jacket, demi jacket, and other outerwear. A miserable child, another saleswoman once expressed a similar opinion to Carolina's. What will she grow up to be with a grandmother like that? Caroline shook her head. She didn't know what to say. And she felt guilty for some reason. It seemed that it was impossible to watch her grandmother raising her granddaughter indifferently all these years, keeping her swaddled in a cocoon of strange frightening, giving off a slight madness of care. That's why Caroline had done that with the sundress. She suddenly realized that it seemed that something special had happened in Juliana's life. Something immeasurably important that moved her to finally break that cocoon. Grandma, Julianne said, let's have some tea. When she returned home, the girl hastily stashed her new clothes in her room and went to the kitchen. She put the kettle on, put out the tea pairs from the special ceremonial set, which, according to the established rules, appear on the table only on holidays. And on the calendar, a magnetic bright square marked the most ordinary Sunday. What's this? The old woman frowned. When did you bake this? I didn't bake, Grandma. Julian smiled and pushed her chair over. Hi, Grandma. Don't be angry, okay? I decided not to go for a walk this weekend, not to the theater, not to go to exhibitions, not to the library, but to work a little. And Julianne told her mentor about what she had been doing. I just decided that I'm graduating soon and I need to, at least some experience, how to work, to get. Leslie sat down at the table. She looked incredulously at the piece of cake her granddaughter had dropped on her plate. Grandma, it's all natural, and it's fresh. But, well, you can't always just bake your own cakes. Sometimes you can also. How much did you make? A thousand, Julian replied. How much is the cake? Five hundred. Where's the rest of the money? I, Julian swallowed hard. The school asked me to take a job as a prom photographer. She blurted out the first thing that came to mind. And when Granny Ray's faded blue eyes squinted intently, Julian had no doubt in those moments she would be exposed now. But here Leslie nodded. It used to be customary to ask your elders what to do. Well, come on, what can I take from you, you foolish girl? And after school, no, no job. You'll go to school. The old woman finally broke off a piece of cake with a dessert spoon. She brought it to her mouth. The granddaughter held her breath. That'll do, Leslie said, and didn't say another word during the tea. Then she asked to have her blood pressure taken and laid down on the sofa in front of the TV to watch a documentary about VDNK. The girl was happy that the cake was favorably received. Her grandmother was amazingly nice, 
The last time Julianne had brought a store-bought cake to the hospital, she had thrown it out the window, shouting that she would not poison herself with palm oil. Maybe today's tea party is a sign of good things to come. Julianne smiled as she finished the dishes, but then she remembered Alfred again. It seemed like an eternity since that unimaginable incident at the cottage, and in all that time she hadn't seen Alfred. It was as if he had disappeared from her life altogether, vanished into thin air. The only thing she knew was that he had dropped out of school after all. However, this surprised few people there, and the head teacher, not hesitating in expressions, prophesied this bully the most terrible end like his father. Julian did not agree with her and almost spoke out loud, but she held back. It wouldn't have made any difference. Who would believe her that Alfred wasn't really as horrible a person as everyone thought he was? Julian had passed her final exams. And finally, the big day of graduation had arrived. The grandmother knew in advance that her granddaughter would wear a dark blue velvet dress, which Juliana's mother once wore to the school graduation. That dress, under a black silk sash, was now hanging on its hangers on the closet door. But yesterday's schoolgirl, going to the main holiday, was now dressing up in front of the mirror, admiring herself in a very different outfit. A sundress with marvelous juicy pink flowers. For the first time, Juliana didn't put her hair in a braid, but instead, having washed it in the evening, twisted it into curls. She didn't have a blowtorch at home, of course, but she used an old folk trick and got the curls with the help of ordinary socks. Granddaughter, what took you so long, huh? You'll be late. Julian flinched when she heard her grandmother, but the smile didn't disappear from her face. She felt more confident than ever. After another glance at herself in the mirror, she walked resolutely to the door. Leslie staggered backwards, and if she hadn't taken her heart pills that morning, she might have had a second heart attack. Because the granddaughter, what a sight she appeared. As if Grishenka wasn't even her own. Grandma, I love you very much. The girl intercepted the old woman's hands, gently squeezed the wrinkled hands with her cold fingers. But in that dress, my mother's dress, I won't go. I bought it for my paycheck. I just, I can't live like this anymore, Grandma. It's not right. And so they stood opposite each other, the old generation and the young, the people most dear to each other, the closest people who sometimes could almost read each other's minds, and at the same time very different, belonging to different worlds. But then Leslie as if died, her lips and chin trembled, her eyes darkened. She took her hands away and sighed deeply, full-breasted, exhaled through her teeth. Julian put her hands behind her back and lowered her eyes. I won't be long, Grandma. I'll just get my diploma, take a picture with the kids in the park, and go home, Grandma. She took a time and stepped toward the door. I'll go, okay. Go, said Leslie, suddenly calm. And don't be in a hurry. It's such a young thing. Stop. She stopped when the girl opened the door to the landing. Leslie opened the soapbox. It was an old ceramic box with roses on the lid. The soap that had been in it almost a hundred years ago smelled of roses too. Now it held cash, which was usually used to go to the store for groceries, to pay the light bill, and so on. Determinedly, the old woman shoveled out all the contents of the box, about 3,000, and handed it to her granddaughter. Here, I remember we didn't give it up for graduation, so give it to whoever needs it. It's not out of favor that they're feeding you. Grandma, go already. The old woman interrupted her and waved her arms as if she were chasing away a butterfly that had accidentally flown into the house, or you'll be late. Julian left. Leslie returned to the hall and sank down in her favorite chair, her hands on the armrest, and closed her eyes. The clock ticked quietly. Tears rolled down from under the old woman's closed eyelids but it was a light sadness just somehow came to suddenly realize that everything, the granddaughter grew up. Though I tried to keep her from foolishness, temptations, vices of this world, but apparently people are right. It is impossible to hide it from the youth. And then Leslie dozed off. Her classmates, who saw Juliana in her new clothes, but most importantly in an unusual form, did not immediately recognize who was in front of them. For a while, the merry murmur subsided and all eyes were fixed on the newcomer. Some of the guys whistled, and many girls looked enviously. It turned out that the odd girl had a gorgeous figure, and her hair, usually hidden in tight braids, was now curling in lush, silky curls. 
Julian. Headmaster Barry approached the girl. You're great. Just, he spread his hands. I wouldn't be lying if I said I've never seen a more beautiful senior in my life. Much later, looking back on this day, Juliana understood that his bright events merged in the end into one long action, like multicolored glasses of a kaleidoscope are put together in one pattern. But this applied to the day exactly until the moment when after a walk in the park, sitting in a cafe and general photographing, she was suddenly called by a familiar voice. The sun was already setting. Its fiery golden rays penetrated the green of the trees and still blinded her. So Juliana squinted her eyes and the silhouette of the guy standing nearby turned out to be quite blurred. Alfred, she said in disbelief. The other seniors didn't even notice her slipping away, their first impressions having dissipated, and they were more interested in each other's company, leaving the strange-looking roommate to her own devices, as in previous years. Alfred stood at the entrance to the park. Alfred was standing at the entrance to the park, again in tattered jeans, but his jacket was a new brownish red one that fit. Congratulations, he said and smiled. You dropped out of school after all, she said reproachfully. But that wasn't what she meant to say when she was almost running toward him. I've been busy selling the apartment and the cottage. He glanced down and back, smirking. And you're a pretty girl, it turns out. Okay, I won't distract you. I nodded at the group of school children in the distance. I'm not with them, Julian replied. I guess I don't fit in with society after all. You don't need that, Alfred said. You'll find other people you'll be comfortable with. It was a strange word and phrase for him in general. Julian squinted her eyes. So you decided to leave after all. I need to find my place somewhere. Okay. He was obviously going to say something else, but he stifled himself and took a step back. Have a nice day. Julian didn't have time to say what she wanted to say. That they needed to talk that he wasn't all alone, that she had to understand, she had to find out how to help him in. But all these thoughts were swarming in her mind. She couldn't put it all out coherently right now. She could only stare at him. How she needed him to take a tiny step toward her. Just the tiniest bit. But he sent her a freezing stare instead. His face contorted hard, and he turned and simply ran. And at the same time, it seemed that he was not just rushing to the bus. He was running away from her and from the conversation that could take place between them. The figures of swans surrounded by live snow-white hyacinths with flecks of candy pink eustoma were beautiful. And if the organizer of this wedding celebration was asked to name the most successful element of the banquet hall decoration, she would have pointed to these ice sculptures. Rhythmically tapping a mini pen on the page of the notebook, the entries in which were so small and abbreviated that only their creator could decipher it, the girl looked at her creation. Splendid. Thanks to this order, she would finally close the mortgage for the apartment, and after it, perhaps she could treat herself to a vacation, which she hadn't been on for the past two years. With a satisfied sigh and a nod to her own thoughts, Julian returned the writing utensils to the pocket of the immaculately tailored smoky gray jacket that went with the pencil skirt and silk blouse in a soft lavender shade. Stylish, but not overly dressy because she, after all, is a responsible person here and in no way should not compete with the bride or even the guests. Guys, this way, came a voice from behind us as the doors opened. Julian rounded her eyes as some workers with a step ladder and some other guy in a black suit entered the room. Over there, the guy stretched out, pointing his hand at the wall. More precisely, on that part of it, which was located behind the seats for the young, and was generously draped with silk and brocade, the folds of which were supported by golden figures of cupids. Hey, what are you doing? The girl stomped indignantly toward the intruders. Don't you dare touch anything? The workers stopped and turned to the supervisors and the supervisors to her. Security, the tall brunette threw and stuck his thumbs behind the belt of his pants and smirked. That came out extremely cheeky. We are working. Please do not interfere. Stay out of it. Julian burst out indignantly. Do you know how long we've been laying this up? What do you think you're doing here? Why didn't I do anything? And then she stopped talking, because the young man's face seemed familiar. Alfred? Apparently, mutual recognition came to them synchronously. Julian? He said, what are you doing here? A wedding? She replied simply and quite matter-of-factly. What are you doing here? 
Working to, he replied. So what should we do? One of the workers asked. Wait a minute. Alfred waved him away and focused his attention back on the young woman in front of him. He remembered her, all those years he'd been picking up the pieces of his life. And she remembered, remembered him, too often than she would have liked, much more often than she should have remembered a guy she knew from school, not even a classmate, whose close acquaintance had taken place under not the most romantic circumstances. But that was the past, and now they exchanged a few more phrases, and it turned out that Alfred is the head of security of the father of the bride Bruce, a complicated man, a businessman, and even an oligarch. Alfred had spent almost all these years in other lands and then, and having built up a solid reputation in the security field, decided to return to the city, which he still considered the most native place. And it was here that he eventually found his best job. I never would have guessed, Julian said frankly, when Alfred informed her what he was doing. Of course, with my pedigree and track record, he replied, and it was not clear whether he was really offended or was being kindly ironic about himself. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Julian was immediately taken aback. It was normal, so familiar, as if all those years apart hadn't happened, Alfred grinned. And you, you create all this? He circled the surrounding space with his hand, cute, but of course terribly girlish, if you know what I mean, not at all. Julian was always very sensitive, on the verge of being painful, to criticism of her creations. She could speak calmly about anything and everything only directly to her clients, but the rest of us would be better to hold our tongues. Julian herself often regretted her temper, but found the reason for it, apparently, it was hereditary, from her grandmother's temper. The decoration is created taking into account the tastes and wishes of the bride and groom. Our agency is focused on the current global trends in wedding fashion, said the girl. Wait a minute, bowed Alfred's head. Ours. Are you married and doing business with your husband? Do you think that's the only way to do it? Julian frowned again. No, just like that, he thought, scratching at the back of his head with a familiar gesture. I'm not married. Wonderful. What do you mean? Oh, never mind. So you started an agency with someone and you do weddings. Mostly them. But we also do wedding anniversaries, engagement parties. Do you celebrate divorces? No. Julian had fallen into such a strange state of mind from the conversation with Alfred that she even missed the trill of her work phone. The girl carried two miniature smartphones, the second one containing only personal contacts. And before such neglect of her professional duties was not peculiar to her. Who would ever think of celebrating a divorce? I don't know, he shrugged. I was celebrating. I went to the sea for two weeks, just lying on the sand and matured, to go on, well, to live. And I asked about you, well, I thought that if you like weddings so much, you should probably be married already, maybe even more than once. Why is that? To the first impressions of delight, surprise, and even heart palpitations, a familiar irritation began to set in. It's just deja vu. So it is a wedding how many different weddings can be played, having the opportunity and imagination. Alfred spoke absolutely serious tone, but his eyes laughed. I'm not married, I haven't been yet, Julian replied, nervously fixing her already perfect hair, which was now a bob. So what do you need to do here? The cameras have lost the image of the auditorium. You must have covered it up with your fancy trinkets. So put the cameras somewhere else. It's got the perfect viewing angle. It's not my problem. The design has already been thought out and it is impossible to change it. Who cares where the bows are? This is about safety. What, are you afraid the bride will be stolen? Don't worry, it's not in the script. I don't know, Alfred was suddenly close, just dangerously close, literally hovering over her with his whole weight. Julian thought, inappropriately, that he'd gotten noticeably bigger or broader in the shoulders. It's been 10 years, Alfred said. You haven't changed at all. But very much so, the girl felt awkward, and for some reason she was sure that the traitorous blush was well visible, despite the foundation, blush, and powder. So what to do? Couldn't stand it. One of the workers, who had a bunch of other things planned for the day. Julian and Alfred backed away, just bounced away from each other like a flock of birds scattering. And soon, with Julian's instruction, the textile decor was moved so that it would not block the CCTV cameras. Well, now everything is ready, the girl said smugly, 
and Alfred visibly revived. So can we talk? Julian wanted to say that she was terribly busy, but that wouldn't be true. And besides, she wanted to talk to the man who had made her heart beat so strangely often all these years. There were still a few hours before the wedding reception at the bride's father's mansion, and Alfred and Julian had agreed to sit on the back porch for a while. It was the quietest place right now. They sat down directly on the steps. In front of them stretched out as if wild, but in fact skillfully cultivated garden in the English style. Juliana told about how after two courses at the university to study philology, she realized that it was absolutely not her business and dropped out, deciding to take a big risk just to make a living for a while, as it turns out and in parallel to look for themselves. In the end, it turned out that she liked to create holidays and five years ago she and Caroline created a small agency, which by now has become one of the leading in the city. Caroline, Alfred was surprised. The one whose husband is an electrician, they also have Victor's son. I remember her. She always treated me differently, he added and averted his eyes. Not like the others. I know, Julian nodded. She and I were talking about you the other day, and she told me all about it, that you weren't a monster at all. And when again, did you think I was a monster? He squinted his eyes as if with resentment. When you invited me to the cottage, I swear, Julian smiled. It was the most nightmarish state of my life. And mine, I'd give anything to have it any other way. And anyway, what an idiot I was. I should have just asked her out in a normal way to a movie, for example. I shouldn't have been afraid that you'd say no. Understandably, the girl nervously tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. The conversation somehow suddenly turned into a direction that was not the most convenient for free conversation. How's grandma? asked Alfred. She's fine. I'm amazed at her age, and she's still going strong. Her health, of course, sometimes fails her. But in terms of fortitude, she's enough for ten people. You know, I've only recently been able to understand her. It seemed to me then, when I had just finished school, that I had escaped from a nightmare. And then, I was able to realize that she just loved me very much and thought to protect me that way. I talked to the doctor. My grandmother is seeing a psychologist, Julian explained and she agreed to go to him to find out why she was having bad dreams, and then he got her talking, and then, it's easier for us to live together. Anyway, the psychologist doesn't want to scare her, but he said it's, it's like she had an obsession. Good thing she stopped in time. You know, sometimes I feel so guilty for leaving grandma alone for so long. But I got her a nurse. She's a very decent woman, she takes good care of her. And now she doesn't need anything. The girl smoothed her skirt on her knees, looked at Alfred carefully, catching his gaze. How long have you been divorced? Last year, I told you we didn't see eye to eye. I guess I'm just not a good person. Somehow I thought you'd changed since then, and not for the worse, so I don't think you're a bad person. Alfred, what about your mother? She said carefully. Do you know what's wrong with her? I mean, have you ever thought about? I found her, Alfred answered, and it seemed that he was ready to answer frankly to this question but only wanted to get off as soon as possible. We talked. Calmly, peacefully, she apologized and told me not to come back. She really has a whole other life. There's no place for me there, but I forgave her. That's it. Julian was silent. They just sat side by side and watched the wind move the tall, lush grasses and the flowers among them. I've forgotten, Julian exclaimed. Master, he. Ten years is a long time for a dog but he's fine. Alfred grinned. He lives here with me. He's in the enclosure now. Do you want to say hello? He stood up and offered his hand to the girl. I do. She rose, accepting the outstretched palm. Do you want to bet? Alfred rammed his eyes. He hadn't expected this at all. Conditions? The master will recognize me immediately, and then you'll give me a personal tour of the place, tell me what the security service does. I only know from movies you walk around and talk to someone on the radio all the time, right? Almost Alfred replied. And if you lose, then you can take a chance and ask me out. The young man grinned. It was a very tempting offer. And whatever the outcome of the bet, he somehow had no doubt that the date would happen and it would be very easy to turn the excursion into one. And Alfred also thought that perhaps now he had to become a really good guy. 
it was necessary to become a good husband for Julianne.